This is Race Hobbs, head of programming over at the Unex Network, and I want to thank you for listening to my good friend, Jeff Kingsbury, on Strange Recon, right here on the X. Sometimes I'll start a sentence, and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this. <laughs> Sign my name on the dotted line. Sign my name on the dotted line. All I do is a double time. All I do is a double time. Oh, f- I can't believe you've done this. Get ready for a surprise. <laughs> What's going on, Recon? This is your host, Jeff White Bear Kingsbury. Welcome to another episode of Strange Recon Podcast. On this episode of Strange Recon, we feature legendary author, researcher, investigator Christian Lambright, who brings the attention of the Paul Benowitz incident, Richard Doty, uh, how the CICCI, all that jazz, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, uh, is, is running the same playbook, if you will. Birds of a feather, you know what I'm saying? Christian Lambright brings awareness to this issue within ufology, and we might be reliving it now with this whole UAP rebranding. All right, if you like what you hear, if you like what you see, please do me a favor, hit that like, subscribe, ring the bell, leave a comment below. It would be super helpful to get the algorithms working, and as well, if you haven't yet, and you're listening on Spotify or Apple, leave a review for the show, please. It would be super helpful if you leave that five-star review. Thank you. Let's get the show going, and before I do, remember, go check out the UNX Network over at www.unxnetwork.com. Let's get the episode going, Mr. Christian Lambright. Welcome to Strange Recon. I'm here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. You out of your f- mind. There's nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. No, I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Clasp, and kissed my ass. He wasn't there. I was. When you know all the names in every language of that bird, you know nothing, but absolutely nothing about the bird. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. I like you. But you're crazy. You know, it's just a courtesy that uh, I'm just hit, I just hit record now, by the way. Um, but um, I, it's a kind of a courtesy that uh, I do video because almost everyone listens to the show. I have a very small video following, but I kind of offer that anyways, you know. No, that's good. Uh, well, that's nice. well, first off, uh, it's nice to meet you. I'm Jeff Kingsbury, the guy on the other end of the Facebook account we've been talking. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Um, <laughs> I'm good. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Right I'm now? Dallas, the Dallas, Texas area. I've been Dallas. in Austin for a while, but I'm up in Dallas. I have kids up here, so it's easier. <laughs> uh, are you? You're not originally from there. Uh, um, no, it's interesting when people ask where I'm originally from, and I think when I was young, my parents were missionaries, and so when I was growing up till about ten years old, I was in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia. Awesome. And uh, then we came back and lived in Kansas City, which is pretty much where I went all the way up through high school and then went to Baylor down here in Waco. That's how I ended up in Texas. And uh, long story short, went to California a little while and then back. But I've been in pretty much the, the Dallas area most of the time. Awesome. Well, are you, are you a fan of Billy Joe Shaver down there in Waco? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you'd, be surprised, you'd actually be surprised to. Well, you know, I mean, like I said, I mean, I've been in Texas long enough that I suppose I, hopefully I don't have too much of a Texan accent, no, but right. um, I'm not the world's largest country music fan either. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was the wacko from Waco, and I don't know, maybe he no, crossed but seriously, I mean, I mean, I like all kinds of music most of the time, though. I, I don't frequent uh, country western places as much as I used to when I first got here, but. Uh, well, they were more popular, certainly, I'm sure um well uh you know speaking of you said you brought up something interesting you grew up you spent some time in indonesia and i um happened to be listening to you on uh, martin willis's show and I, I did hear that you said your parents actually had a ufo encounter in indonesia in indonesia yeah it was one that i actually wasn't familiar with until at one point years later i had been interested in this subject for quite a while and i happened to bring up the uh 1959 papua new guinea case the father gill case mm-hmm. And it was my mother who said, well, that's just about the time we had our sighting. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And I did check with my father later on, but it, 
apparently, um, and you have to remember back then, there really wasn't much electricity anywhere. The only airport was in Jakarta, which is on the, the uh, western end of the island. And we were in a little town called Kadidi, which is more on the eastern end, kind of down towards Surabaya and Bal Bali, you know, that end. And so at night, there weren't airplanes flying around. There was hardly anything there. And my parents and uh, some of the other missionaries, from what I was told, had gone to a, a meeting at the local town mayor's house, I think it was. And they were all sitting outside on chairs watching, a, I guess, a movie projected on a screen outside. And um, my mother said, all of a sudden, they noticed they looked up in this big, round object. I mean, I, I'm not clear from talking to my parents whether the, it was just glowing solidly or whether it was just lit up with lights all around it. But apparently, let's face it, it shouldn't have been there. Something glowing that my understanding was it was about, if you know, a, a coconut tree is about, think of a telephone pole, mm -hmm. about twice the height of a telephone pole above this crowd of maybe 20 or 30 people sitting outside. This glowing disc shaped thing slowly moves in over their heads and hovers for a minute. And they were just aghast looking up at this thing. And then it slowly moved off kind of in a little V direction from where it came in. That's awesome. And and then she she said, yeah, we were like, wow, that's a you know, flying saw, that's a UFO. And the thing that struck me the most was that it seemed like afterwards they said they drove home with one of the other missionary couples and nobody really talked about it. I don't remember either. My parents had any special interest in the subject. And and I, I to me, I suppose, and maybe that just is why I'm into this kind of thing like I've been all this time, you know, that I was flabbergasted because I would have thought, how could you not? have your entire worldview changed if you saw something like that, especially in those days. And you know, we talk of historical times, but no matter what people think of these days, we didn't have this technology, no drones, no all of that kind of thing back then, which of course is why the Papua New Guinea Father Gill case is so profound, more so even than, you know, than uh, what my parents saw, but the idea that none of this, you know, and I've, my whole take on it is no matter what people want to think about secret programs, you know, my understanding was even Father Gill said that he, they, they pretty much decided, oh, it was some new invention of you Americans. And I'm like, you know, when you stop and think about how much money is spent every year, and I think I just saw some news item just, just today or yesterday that now the Air Force wants to switch from and forgive me if I'm wrong, from the F-35s to some of the new F-22s or whatever they want to buy, 35 more planes, budgets are coming and going. And if there was a technology like this back in 1959, it would be old version <laughs> now. We would have had, yeah. I would think it would be out. We'd know about it. So something tells me that a lot of what uh, the fact that we, this kind of thing goes back so far to a time frame when by now it would have been old technology they would have rolled it out of the hangar and shown it to all the congressmen so they can get next year's budget so it would be old hat now we wouldn't be still flying around and you know the, the things we've got but but needless to say that's uh it's a fascinating know, case of, well it's one of one of my pet peeves about this whole thing is that we keep relabeling it in some very innocuous terms uap what Father Gill saw, and I mean, and I'm telling you, having grown up over there, these aren't, the people that are in those areas are not backwards people. I mean, they are sharp as anybody else. I mean, whatever you want to call it, they knew what they were seeing. My parents knew what they were seeing. You go all the way historically up till, till you know, through any of the 1964 timeframes and, and you realize those aren't what we're talking about when we use the, even the term UFO or UAP, which are kind of dismissive, short-sighted terms to allow, I think, elbow room so that you can, you know, play off the confusion of it. You know, when I talk with my friends, when we talk about what we're talking about, that's not what, <laughs> what those terms are used for these days, but. Yeah, that, there's, some, there's a message that I try to push on the show quite often, actually, and that would be the, the I, I at least be open to at least three things happening. There being real UFOs, whatever that may be here and observing us or sometimes interacting with us. There'd be major breakthroughs throughout time happening with our own government that would, yes, appear to be downright magical. You know, Arthur C. Clarke style, you know, when you occur for the first time, encounter for the first time, 
it looks as if how mysterious it ever would appear. And then, of course, there's that last one, which is, which is quite frankly, we don't really have any actual answers that reconcile the things that go on in the human brain very well. We're still pretty, like, behind all that. So a lot of the factors that come into the paranormal, especially ufology, fall somewhere in the three that we, you know, that you, you know, that are like super outrageously strange. And then these two other things. And if we, and if you just take the contrast out of all of it, you get what's happening in modern day, almost like the just labeling it all UAP turns it all, all the magic, it uh, brings all the magic in, uh, into real life and in everything else and disclosure equals meeting aliens. And I don't, it's this self-perpetuating belief system that's happening that I don't know what's going on. Yeah, what are your I thoughts mean, on all that? There's, there, I, I agree. I mean, unfortunately, there was an, an article that I just saw again the other day that um, was based on something Carl Sagan had written some years ago in which he was expressing dismay over this whole idea of people's inability to discern the truth and how it's leading to everybody kind of just anything goes. Whatever you believe, you believe what you want. I actually, I won't name names, but a very famous person involved in this, one of the pillars of ufology, if you want to say, a gentleman who made a statement which I've thought a lot about. And now I'm troubled more by it, which is this, the comment was, what does it matter as long as they believe? And I'm it, like, well, wait a minute. Is this a recent what? statement, sir? Sorry to cut you off there. Is that a recent say, statement? Within, within the last year. And it was not really? said to me. It was said indirectly to someone else. But when I saw it, I, I was thinking, now, wait a minute. It does matter what people <laughs> believe. And unfortunately, that's the world we live in now because everybody, I mean, even Sagan was making the point that with everybody's trying to get clicks and everybody's trying to lure people into looking at everything because you're monetizing everything. So it doesn't really matter what the, the truth is as long as people watch it. But unfortunately, people's inability to discern the truth leaves them in a position of filling in the blanks with, and unfortunately, with too often what they want to believe. Oh, yeah. And I mean, yeah. I've had this analogy that, you know, you have little kids and when the parents want them to feel safe and be quiet, you give the kid the little teddy bear or whatever his little toy is that he holds on to and it gives him a sense of, of security. Mm -hmm. Well, when we grow older, what's that thing that we hold on to for our sense of security as adults? And it's too often it's beliefs. But I've had too many disappointments now that I, I tend to say, I don't believe anything anymore. I mm -hmm. know one or two things for sure. Everything else, I, I have my opinions and I think certain things based on what I've seen, but the facts, that's what, that's all that matters. I've heard it said, it's the data, you know, the data mm -hmm. is what really matters and you need to be basing your opinions on that data and not relegating it to belief, you know, whatever you choose to believe, I suppose, in that particular case. Yeah. I say I bring it up quite often about how they, they through psychology and philosophy of science, you can basically see the history of how human beings will, when when not having the appropriate tools or the data to actually go through, you know, you make decisions that are premature and come to things like, uh, you know, specifically recently been talking about how how many people I know in this field that were trying to like put together works about the consciousness reasons behind these uh lights are these drones uh messing with the navy this is all before we had the log that showed uas system writ, writ, you know put right down on the piece of paper so they were already applying some alien psychology to what was happening i mean I, and of course some of these things absolutely could be completely uh you know they well according to the report are unexplainable but you know it, it's when you jump to conclusions oftentimes you are you're taking the most radical exactly. choice and that falls people, inside. people project what their mindset is too often. And unfortunately, ah, you know, we hear the term propaganda, but you also hear, you know, confidence men or women. And it really simply boils down to people being misled or someone who's got a purpose behind using your, what I like to call your preferred belief and spinning the information in such a way to implant that idea in your head. Or implant the idea that it may be so far out there you know you made the comment about uh, um, indistinguishable from magic that people see things and if it's that far in advance well but if it's so spurious and it's so innocuous and there's you don't know if it's a uas is it a drone is it a something it's a what's it 
well, then we can project whatever we want onto it. And it's like everybody goes to the bar and orders their own flavor of <laughs> drink, whatever style you want, and everybody gets feeling happy. And unfortunately, that's yeah. that, on that road lies madness. But and you can that that's actually it's an industry in itself. I think if you if you really track down culture is speaking where that's happening, you can see that happening qu quite a bit on a lot of fronts. I remember taking political science courses and recognizing that every decision in politics has you have to look at whatever you're hearing as the as the result of of being most beneficial to the success of that administration or party or whatever it may be. So, so oftentimes you're getting the entire wrong well, context of the facts. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and it's understandable in a way. It doesn't matter whether you're the husband or the wife or the parents talking to the kids or your job or anybody else, you know, everybody's trying to keep this thing, the juggling going. So it all balances out and everybody gets kind of what they want and everything as I say, everybody rows in the same direction and you get further along. Unfortunately, if you look at what bothers me the most is everybody, even the worst of us, the worst of humankind people, tends to see things and then interpret them in a way that puts the positive spin on their angle, their viewpoint, or on themselves. They want to see themselves as okay. Uh, Ted Bundy, Hitler, if you ask them to explain why they were the way they were, they're going to come up with some, because from <laughs> we're all trying to keep ourselves out of hot water, so to speak. But sometimes I am afraid people convince themselves and look for reinforcement of their own personal convictions. And either, just like we see going on in the world today, they somehow presume that if everything was the way they wanted it, or if people would hear what they had to say and do it their way, it would be, everything would work out. And then you end up with desperate rulers and uh, autocrats and authoritarian people who decide this is what, I, but they never come back and say, you, I want you to do it my way. It's always couched in very glowing terms. I'm doing it for the greater good. I'm that's doing it for all of us, you know, because that's the only way to get people to sign on to it. Unfortunately, yeah. we have that same situation to some degree in ufology. Right now, you have we're all promised disclosure. Uh, that's not what we're getting. <laughs> you know, that's not what mm -hmm. we have these days at all. It but. felt an it felt an awful like uh, awful lot like. Uh... Um, you know, I was make I, I make the joke, but you chase a chase a lion up a tree, you're gonna die tired or something. Like you chase a mountain lion, like you know, and in when you when you chase the secret keepers deeper into the labyrinth, they they tend to lead you right where you want to go in a place that they've prepared. And, and 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 I know that's all super speculation. I know that is because there's just no way to really. I mean, that's that's the nature of secret keeping. It's like it's really hard to kind of nail exactly what you want to, and and everyone will then judge you based off of your failed you know hypothesis here but ultimately speaking we've seen a few things return around in ufology and in my point of view my own bias that is that that has something to do with you know major leaps in technology or or, or electronic warfare or autonomous systems and things like that it seems to be where that spikes up and you know i know you you just spoke on martin's show about um uh paul benowitz and stuff and the, and the whole experience with Doty. but the problem with that is is uh before I ask you about that again, ask one if you talk a little bit about it with me. But the problem I noticed with that is that every time that story gets out and people are made aware of things that happened like that, the magnitude of population here, it, I mean, it changes in magnitude. So you're never going to catch up with it. You just simply won't get the story out enough where everyone's going to know that there are reasons to have dif disinformation. There are uh, there are examples in the history that we can point right at and say, here, look, and there are times that happen similar like that. Um, but uh, without getting too deep into it, can you can you just um were, first off, were you a confidant of Paul's, or how did you did you were you as an investigator at the time, or um, I was, I guess, an investigator, <laughs> if you want to call it that way. I, I laugh when I think of the fact that I just have this bad habit of deciding I'm going to find out for myself and pick up the phone and call. Well, just I've done that so many times, and often it pays off. Um, 
a short version story, Jesse Marcel, the Roswell guy, picked up the phone and just called him and kind of killed my some of my interest in Roswell. At least my efforts would be spent elsewhere. But with Paul Benowitz, it was basically the idea, and, and I was not in touch with him early on, meaning right in 79 and 80 when he originally got the first films. I had good friends, Tom Adams, Gary Massey, Tom Bland. Um, I had, you know, had spoken with a lot of these people who knew Gabe Valdez because originally Paul's interest started because of the peculiar things that were going on in the northern New Mexico, southern Colorado area around the cattle mutilation time frame. This was all throughout the 1970s. But, um, but within a few years, you know, after that, when it began to, the information began to come out, but you began to hear both sides. I mean, it was back then, it was already this idea of some guy who thought he was communicating with aliens and you were hearing all of the spin about the, the craziness going on. But then some of those first documents were coming out as well, which seemed to suggest, and the one that first piqued my interest was the documents they refer to as the Kirtland documents, which they are on the internet, anybody can find them, that actually had talked about Paul having been brought to a meeting on the base on Kirtland Air Force Base in the fall of 1980 and which he was Brigadier General I think William Brookshire and a number of other people were there and Paul presented some of the information that he had and my first thought was wait a minute the Air Force is not going to have all these top level people at a meeting on the base to talk with a guy who just thinks he's communicating with aliens, that he's picking up stuff, whatever you want to call it, that I, I, did not make sense to me. I mean, they, they were not going to have the guy down there and have documents exist that would open this whole can of worms that there was, that, that was all it was. So I found Paul's phone number and called him. And in the first conversation, by that time, he was already talking some rather peculiar things. I mean, when I use the terms, alien pragmatism and things that were, whoa, I mean, the look on your face right now is exactly the look that I had at the time, because I was like, wait a minute, no, okay, I'm trying to be polite and listen. But I, be, I was still thinking, no way, if he's talking this way to whoever it was, Doty or Edwards or anybody, no way is the people on the base going to say, sure, bring him down here. And let's go on the record and have some documents that are going to be sitting there showing we brought this guy that. So I asked Paul, I said, well, what was it that you contact, you called the Air Force about what made you call them in the first place? I mean, what was it you called them about? And his response was, oh, it was the films that I got. Wait a minute. Even then, even at that time. I had known nothing, of, you see what I mean? Even back then, the knowledge of those actual films that he got from his roof was not being widely disseminated. It was all the crazy kind of stuff. And I personally don't think it took more than six to eight months for the fix to be in, some decision made to just diffuse, to diffuse him. But when I began to ask him about the films and he began to reiterate, you know, talk about them, I was like, whoa, 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 wait. I'm backing up a little bit here thinking, you know, I mean, I'd heard other people who had talked to Paul, Bill Moore, some of the other people around at the time, but none of them were really reiterating this kind of stuff. And even at one point I asked Bill Moore about it and his reaction, oh, they were just little lights. Well, I had been talking to Paul. This is now over a year or two's time period. I didn't have telephone conversations with him. And some of them I recorded on cassette tape. But at one point, I was asked to give a talk to the local MUFON group in Dallas. And so I asked Paul, I said, hey, I would like to talk about what your films. And he sent me a FedEx box about two feet by two feet and I opened it up and in there mounted on black boards were photos of these from his films. And even the original, what first got him interested in UFOs started when he was actually up in the Northern New Mexico area with Gabe Valdez. 
and had gone out on a night ride. I describe a lot of that in the book. But before he left, he took a Polaroid snapshot of just kind of a scenery of where he'd been. And apparently when he got back to Albuquerque and showed it to his wife, and his wife said, well, what's this little thing up here in the air behind this tree? And I admit, I blew that thing up in Photoshop and I've enhanced it. And I have no idea what it is, but it has some shape to it. I mean, I'm not going to say more. It's just... It was enough to get him interested. So he made several trips back. This was even before he got on the roof. In the latter six months or seven months of 1979, he had gone back and forth on two or three trips to the area up around the Dulce, Archelita Mesa. I think his son went with him once. But it was on the last trip when he got home and his wife said, man, she'd heard some crazy loud noise above the house late at night and the dog woke up barking. And I guess in Paul's mind, because right at, by that time he was prepped, for thinking he'd been, and if you hear his descriptions of some of the things that he had been looking at and seeing up in the, the New Mexico area, it's pretty interesting kind of stuff that he describes. So he began to wonder if what he'd been paying attention to up there might somehow have <laughs> keyed in on him and followed him to wherever he is in Albuquerque. And since it was, I think it was over the Christmas holidays and it was getting extremely cold, he had said he had made his last run to the Dulce area before the first winter snows came in. So he's at home in Albuquerque and he just decides he's going to get up on his roof and just kind of scan the area. And I remember looking at some of the details that he had said about the temperature and that there was no moon. And so I checked the almanacs trying to track down. I had some other information that indicated his first contact with Ernest Edwards at, in, at the base in, uh, in Albuquerque was in January. So I knew I have a window of whenever he came, the last time he came back from the Dulce area, which the based on the best I could place, it was probably somewhere around November, late November, December of 1979, somewhere in that, and he still had some camera in the film in his camera from that trip, but he's up on his roof when suddenly one night he sees these odd things off in the distance at the foots of the Manzano Mountains, which if anybody looks at Google Maps, you can see the Manzano is about a three mile long almost north and south, three mile long stretch of mountains. And they may still have some things going on there. I know at the time there were nuclear weapons and other odd things buried in those bunkers that you can see along the ledge there. But he got these films of these objects, leaping on, jumping up off the ground and shooting off and going south. And at one point, even his wife got out there with him and saw these things. And by that time, he's shooting them with some heavy duty equipment. I mean, a, a eight millimeter film camera, something mounted on a telescope and a Hasselblad with a 250 millimeter lens. And so he's filming these whole things. And if you look at some of those images, those aren't drones, those aren't helicopters, those aren't, you know, the simple response the Air Force had to him having gotten those films is revealing enough, in my opinion, that, that that's something that, I don't know, my best, I mean, I'm making a, speculative assessment to say my opinion at the moment is whatever those things were they were being allowed to come and go at that time when nobody should have been on their roof looking out there and you really have to be you have to look at paul's house where he was in the four hills section up on the top roof he's about three stores up now he's seen way over the fence straight towards the foothills if you're down in albuquerque you're not, if, even if you're out in, in the wintertime when it's 20 degrees, you're probably not looking off at the dark at the base. Mm. These things were coming and going at these times where they'd come in and sit down for several hours at times. And his wife was out there at one point looking at him. I think it was Paul that wasn't supposed to be out there. But uh, needless to say, when he picked up the phone and called the Air Force, you know, I mean, I remember at one point asking him, I said, Paul, don't you figure, don't you feel like when you called them that you were letting the cat out of the bag? And he said, well, you can't be too paranoid, which I understand what he meant, but the thought did go through my mind, you know, but maybe you weren't paranoid enough, you know, to just realize the possible consequences of letting them know that you were, you had actually got these things on film. But needless to say, that seemed to have been what it actually, it seems to me, just from the time frame that I, the best, the best I could, I don't claim to know everything there is, but the best I've got from things he sent me and, and told me was there seemed to be about a four month, five month period in there 
that we have no records of. If Paul called Ernest Edwards, who Ernest Edwards at the time was in charge of the security men with the uh, inside the perimeter fence on the Manzanos. When Paul called him, he was put in touch with Edwards. Edwards referred Paul to Richard Doty, who was the counterintelligence FOSI guy at the time. Edwards apparently got to know Paul fairly well as also, and, and Edwards always struck me as a decent guy. Um, but there's no records. We have these documents that, you know, the, the Kirtland documents I mentioned. And it, but the point is, it seemed like there was a three or four months period in there where I think maybe Paul was, I don't know what the term to use, playing ball. You know, he was now in touch with the Air Force and Doty, and these guys were coming up talking to him and looking at what he's got, and he felt like something was going to happen. I, I'm guessing this. But at some point, it seemed to me he either became a little bit suspicious or a little bit frustrated, perhaps, that nothing was happening the way he expected. And I did see some... I've read some things some places that indicated he may have kind of, my term would be, started to go off the reservation, um, making phone calls. At one point, there was a comment that somewhere towards the White House or maybe at Los Alamos, he began to reach out and, I think, get other people interested, spread the word around. Um, never mind that he was had already been affiliated with APRO and had already been in touch with them about this which is another interesting thing because the APRO documents, the records on this seems to have vanished, but a whole lot of other APRO files. There's a long story on that. But needless to say, there's no records of anything until what's referred to as the Craig Wetzel letter. And this is really where I had a turning point and feel free to butt in and ask questions, but I'm trying to give the synopsis here of this. This is where I think something changed because a person named Craig Wetzel, someone, actually I spoke with him, so I know there was a guy named Craig Wetzel, who had apparently been there, and some of the information that was in that Wetzel letter, Craig Wetzel did not back up. A basic story of somebody had seen some craft landing, whatever else. The point to me, though, is that letter was sent to APRO in July, I think, in June or July of 1980, and it's the first place that has the name Doty written in it. That the person they had talked, this Wetzel and his friend had spoken with, I think, was a guy named D-O-D-Y, Doty. But it's sent to APRO. And my feeling is that's probably the first place that some effort was being made to be sure if anybody follows up on Paul or anything else, they're going to end up reaching Richard Doty somehow. Even though there's a story involving that letter that involves Bill Moore and and how Bill Moore ends up working with APRO in Tucson and has this Wetzel letter handed to him, but then claims he didn't do anything with it, which uh, there, that was marked a turning point when I began to look into that a little more closely. But needless to say, after that, just about everybody who made any effort to check up on any of the events at Kirtland, the UFO sightings, whatever you want to call it, they'll end up becoming known to Richard Doty, and then you have all the rest of the information, which I don't know how much of it is actually truthful or is like the videos we have today. They just put out some really intriguing documents like <clears throat> to attract everybody, and then everybody scatters searching for everything else. And most yeah. people end up forgetting about Paul Benowitz. And in fact, if you look at the Kirtland documents and you look closely at them, you'll realize they don't make it clear that they had heard from Paul and had been talking to Paul for six, seven, eight months before the documents came out. They just mentioned the name of a guy named Paul Benowitz who's been interested in these objects. Then they talk about the Coyote Canyon Air Force mechanic guy who allegedly saw it. And then they go into the meeting that was that took place. And then everything just begins to spread out. And then you have all these other people that became involved with Krista Tilton and that just stooped the whole idea of underground bases and Paul and and at that yeah. point, I don't know. Paul seemed to, so I'm, Paul, like a lot of us, I'm afraid, who was kind of newly into this stuff, bought it, I'm guessing, maybe just bought into things he was being told by people that he thought he should trust. And, yeah. and at that point, it's, you know, it just, everything seems to go off the rails. But 
Yeah, no, it, thank you for putting stringing that together. For a lot of people, they <clears throat> they had never really well when they hear it, they hear the you know the key points. Well, this guy was forced to you know he went and he was driven insane by the Air Force or someone you know for for seeing these things. And there's the constant there's the constant fight still today that that there were like vertical takeoff drones and stuff landing in nets, and that's all he was seeing from miles away. And then there's also the other side of it, which is well, from the material side, there is hey, there's there's even at that point, there were already 30 something years into mass reduction and, and they were figuring out the anomalies there. And that's pretty phenomenal when you think of what the outcome is. And, and, and I know I'm just ranting here, but in 1988 Inman, Bob Inman, you know, he was just on, uh, it just did a podcast the other day, uh, aging Bob Inman, former, uh, leader, uh, undersec or deputy, what is it? Deputy of the CIA and, and, and a bunch yeah, of other things. Bobby, Bobby Ray Inman, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, and he he's you know he wrote a he partially wrote a paper in in the late eighties or, or mid to late eighties about how rockets have come to an end other than basically trade value like that's there's really you know and that's in the eighties and we're now you know well, but yeah obviously they haven't gone that far <laughs> I, no, I mean so, how you want to count the, the idea of rockets yeah so, I mean it but I but I'm not sure I I don't know where I I fall on that because I feel like there's enough anecdotes that, that scream that there's obviously things being kept extremely secret. And then there's the other side where you have the Doty figures out there and you still have people quoting him. So then you, you don't know, oh my God, well, I don't want to dip my foot in that pool because then you, here I go, you know, listening to Doty well, about underground gunfights and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, there are a couple of things that are kind of just hard. If you really want to, <laughs> however you want to word it, you know, if you really would like to have some idea of the truth of what's going on with what I call the real phenomenon, not just the things that people throw the term UAP, UAS, UFO, <laughs> orbs. People throw that out there. Just it's a catch-all. What I what I ref, when I think of the real phenomenon, I'm thinking first, give me some data that indicates there's a vehicle, there's something, something built. Uh, you don't have to have. I mean, for example, Fravor's story of the Nimitz case. Yeah. Well, here you have something that was doing things down there. When he approached it, it seemed to react to him. He's very clear that it seemed to recognize he was coming and it took up and it moved around. I don't know what it was made of, but I don't think it would be hard to imagine that somebody was seeing that as displaying some situational awareness or some degree. Whoever was controlling the thing had some awareness that this jet's flying in or whatever this thing is, and it didn't want to stick around and it took off. There's some level of intelligence there, but the structure of it, plus some of the other things that were being reported, when you go back to, like I said, Papua New Guinea, you come to any number of really, really great cases that we've seen where it does seem to indicate some kind of structured device. If you look at some of the images that Paul took, there's an image where two of the objects, I think, were caught at the same time. One of them is on the ground, and you can definitely make out what appear to be these lights around the periphery you know so it's not just a blob you can definitely yeah. see something and if you and if you examine one of the other objects as it's taken off you can actually begin to see if you've ever looked at these images of solar flares where they seem to arc up arc up off of the limb of the sun mm -hmm. you get this kind of an effect i was looking at one earlier today when i was thinking about you and one of the smaller objects you can tell there's different color patterns in this thing, but you can see this if you really get into the separating the light and dark values of it, you begin to realize, whoa, there is something going on in, above this object. It's not mm. just a drone and it's not just a, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what it was. I'm not saying it was aliens at all. Listening to Paul's description of seeing these things coming around the end of the mountain, coming in it, and in five seconds, boom, not, not hovering like a helicopter trying to find the landing spot and then settling down, coming in as one that zips in, comes in straight down, lights out. Yeah. Nah. It reminds it, me of maybe some of these racing drones these days could do that, but I think you'd still be hard pressed <laughs> to have that kind of immediate stop and turn. So, yeah. Needless to say, I mean, it's just to me, the idea that uh, still, well, let me put it this way. You look at the world we live in today. I know not everything that we've been told from the to the stars offset is not factual. We've been 
the UFO community, maybe the world at large, for reasons I don't know, I don't understand, have been given a pretty little picture of the way things were and who's this and who did that. And now we've, Harry reads, okay, some of it doesn't add up. But at the same time, if this is, if some of these things are a technology that's out there, whoever gets it first, right? Whoever's going to grab that brass ring and manages to do this first, it's going to be, I mean, think of the first nuclear weapons, the race to get the first one out there. Because once you've got it, and now with what's going on around the world today, now you've got every, there was something on the news the other day, how many other countries are going to be trying to get their hands on some kind of nuclear weaponry because it suddenly gives you a seat at the table and nobody's going to jump your stuff. Yeah. Well, this other technology, if it's out there, you're going to, let's face it, I'm a good American. I definitely would prefer <laughs> that our side at least get it first or not be left holding the bag. So is that an issue that's secretive enough that I might understand? Of course. I mean, I, you know, and who's to say if, why would you disclose that? Yes, if whoever it was, if it's aliens, if it, look what the world's doing just with the people we've got in it. If you suddenly had this, and it's a hard catch 22 for even me, because I know there are plenty of people like me who would really be interested to know what the truth is before I pass from this earth. But at the same time, I can understand why the people who might be having to make the decision of what do we keep secret or what do we not. But the flip side of the coin is that either everybody counts or nobody counts. What happened to Paul? You know, so goes, as went Paul, so goes all, so to speak. Mm. Would you want that to happen to your father or your son? If somebody, if he just happened to stumble onto something and, and Paul didn't rush out and immediately try to become a social influencer and he's going to make bucks off of it. He picked up the phone and called the Air Force. He was trying to do it like Doty mentioned. Paul was a patriot. He tried to call and tell them because he thought, he actually said, he thought the, that there was no reaction. They may have not be aware that he sees these objects come in fast and sit down. So mm-hmm. he called them. Yeah. And no yeah. doubt they stuck it to him. So is that yeah. what you feel you deserve as an American citizen? If you thought you were doing the right thing? And at the same time, if your government is acting like you're a fool and you're now left to go out and try to make decisions on your own based on wrong information or no information, how are you supposed to be sure you're making the right decision if they're telling you, it's, I get it, it's a catch-22, right? It's a tough it's, We're stuck. <clears throat> We're stuck, unfortunately, uh, with a crowd, crowd rule, but... Um... I will say that it does just kind of, I mean, like, I know it's easy to, uh, there's only a few cases, so we're trying to, and, and obviously the bias instantly injects itself, but, I mean, Paul brought the attention of what he witnessed to the Air Force, whereas in Tom DeLong brought his good intentions directly to those connected to it. Um, there were the, 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 you know, Office of, Spe- uh, of Special Investigations um, obviously has its roots directly from the CI community. In which we see DeLong return with just a modern day variant instead of having his very, uh, you know, uh, look of the time. We have a guy who's got uh, tattoos in his arms and a goatee out, making very broad stroke statements about what things happening with zero substantiated claims and quantifiable data to see. Really, I mean, and and uh, you know, and ultimately speaking, I know a lot a lot of things on the topic that have to do with true UAP. Now, I'm saying, I'm, and the term the Navy has described them. That have nothing to do with aliens whatsoever. So when I see this person deliver that same statement over and over again, it just reminds me like, whereas in Tom DeLong might have been the new modern version of, of Paul Benos in a different way, whereas in the internet is kind of like more. I mean, where, where he went straight to they went straight to the writers, the people that are gonna get the data out there. Whereas in now there's 180,000 some odd podcasts with UFO related in the description, and he's done almost all of them. Yeah. I mean, it's the shows on the television that frustrate the daylights out of me. I I don't even want to watch them. That's why I don't even really read the UFO (laughs) groups anymore because a group, I mean, on Facebook rather is what I meant. 
a group will start with one specific thing in the title and before long it just <laughs> becomes another catch-all for every little topic that's thrown out there and you end up with a mishmash of everything that there is um tom DeLong, you know it's that's a story in itself i mean uh, it's incredible like tom's music i have no problem with that i used to listen to him in the car with my kids <laughs> you know some good <laughs> stuff good music um guy had the bravado to go to approach you know people at uh lockheed this story i mean i remember what i read about that i'm not sure his take on it is everybody seems to have their own preferred beliefs and their approach and his books secret machines and whatnot but where i get interested is what was happening when Tom DeLonge first started, and I don't mean to go into the subject if it's not the way oh, you want I'd to talk love about. to. That's exactly but what I'd love to talk about. My take on what I've seen and read, Tom DeLonge is first approaching some Air Force guys, generals, his Air Force generals, um, McCasland, a couple of others. And a lot of this comes out in the letters that he was uh, emailing back and forth to Podesta. Hillary Podesta, Hillary Clinton's guy. But somewhere right in the midst of this, and much of this is we're talking in a three to six month time frame from the mid, whenever it was, 2015, I think. 2015, to yeah. Early 6, 2016. When all of a sudden you'll notice his Air Force guys drop off the map. Suddenly he's met some people and he's flying down to texas and then all of a sudden you have the two the stars core people and if you look at it and i think it even he describes some of this in the beginning preface of his book he was talking to the lockheed guy when all of a sudden the lockheed guy tells him to fly to washington and he meets what he calls his CIA man, which I, me, 98% certain based on what I put together, that's Kit Green. And I'm like, wait a minute, how did Kit Green get into this picture? Tom DeLong was talking to the Air Force men and the Lockheed guy, where all of a sudden did Kit Green come into the picture? And then he writes to Podesta and says, now I'm supposed to fly to Texas to meet some very important people. A friend of mine was the one who even said, yeah, Texas, that sounds like how put off. And then all of a sudden you've got you know, like I've said, I have tried to reach out to some of these people. I mean, I don't want to be talking about people that I've not tried to at least contact, you know, just to ask questions. But I realize I'm probably not the person you want to get <laughs> to yeah. ask questions about because it strikes me that the same Kit Green, who was involved with the origin early on with NIDS and Bigelow, but whose name did not appear anywhere appears in the formative positions with the whole bass and was there at offset, but his name doesn't appear on anything. Was there behind all of this that led to to the stars, but his name doesn't appear on any of that. And now we're back in the same position where we were. And in fact, after the last four years, my take on this was last four years of all this promise and hoopla and the Nimitz case was coming out. And all this turmoil, running people around like chickens in the in the yard, running around chasing all the pieces. And now it all is just tired out, and everything is pretty much dropped. You look at the Facebook groups; you don't hear any more about the Nimitz case. You, everything's quieting down. More documents from other things, and I think it's my my opinion is this was the plan. This was the plan all along. Somebody, even the UAS, now well now they've thrown now we're now it's called UAP. UAP task force, but they can go to Congress and give briefings to Congress on all the drone swarms that were seen around our ships from here to Timbuktu. And technically that meets the criteria for reporting on UAP since that's a catchphrase that could be anything. Yeah. So they don't necessarily have, and we're not going to hear anything from it anyway. I mean, you remember. Harry Reid's comment in his interview with George Knapp about Congress, <laughs> the thing about Congress's statement that if we've never done it before, we're not going to do it now. 
and they've never had a real disclosure before. And guess what? Guess who's going to run the new task force? The same group who stepped in and ran interference with Harry Reid's program within the first before the first year was even over. OUSDI, not NASA, not some technologically, you know, some, not some organization that's not in the defense industry or military side of things. It's not the Academy of Science is going to be doing it. It's Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, which happens to exactly be where Lou Elizondo came out of and happens to be where Chris Mellon used to work. And who are the people that Harry Reid, you can find this in his interviews and comments, that he claimed were the ones who ran immediately began to come in and run interference. One of the top guys that he named as running interference on it is now Vice President at Lockheed. Wow, how that works out. <laughs> Who's that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly in the... There was a guy who worked in the office of the Under Secretary of Defense or Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, a new person just took over the other day for Skunk Works, but not, not the entire no, corporation. No. There are a couple of people mentioned. I think you may be able to find the mentions in... I don't know whether John Greenwald has made some comments. That I just can't remember. There was a lady whose name I think started with a B and another gentleman you may be able to find i in fact i'm trying to think the name of Latrell. something about that sounds familiar i think there may have been a statement that Eric oh jim Davis, to slay no, to slay no no i'm sorry i'm saying the name wrong is it this no, guy right here there was a comment in one of the facebook groups i think where somebody had made a mention of whatever became of the whole what happened to the whole asset thing and apparently there was a comment that Harry, right before Harry Reid submitted his SAP letter or whatever. But I believe it was Eric Davis who came in and mentioned there was a lady, last name was like Borelli or something like this, and another guy who ran interference and basically killed the program. You'll find it. His name, I think, starts with an L. Um, gosh, you know, if I had my own documents open here, I might have been able to find my own notes on this. Uh, I'll have to look for him and see if I can find him. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. That was just an interesting coincidence, I thought, that this guy who was there, and they, apparently his name is running interference, is now a vice president at Lockheed, which is mm. where Douglas Kurth ended up after huh. working for Bass, too. So. Uh, well, yeah, that's actually a good little segue there, um, because I was I was hoping we spoke about Mr. Kurth. Now, this gentleman, can you see the share screen I'm showing? Yes. Yeah, okay, so... This guy right here, I've been trying to introduce him a little bit to the story, and people don't uh, seem to recall him even being involved whatsoever. But I thought it was, you know, I mean, you know, I've been reading what you've been doing over the uh, last few years now. I, I thought it pretty interesting that this man had a place in the story and and never really came out, but yet was kind of crucial in the fuel to why they even gave a damn about the Nimitz encounter in the first place. You know, I'll, it, I'll admit maybe it's just frustration with getting older because. You look like you're about 25 or 30, but <laughs> thank you. Father. I appreciate I it. Be your father. But needless to say, it is frustrating. And I had, you know, right now, I've, I still, I'm doing things. I have things I want to do. I want to do some documentaries, finding out some interesting stuff on old case, cases that I've had an interest in. But it seems to me, and this is frustrating, I'll admit it's disappointing that. My take right at the moment seems to be that what I think is significant or is important, and you made a comment earlier, which I agree. Does the Defense Department owe me anything? No. Are they obliged to tell me just because I'm frustrated? Of course not. I get that, which does make me think I need to decide a different path. But I had written a number of articles on this OSAP thing, back to Doug Kerr, the reason I brought that up. Um, because initially there were little this is way back in 2019 2018 there were things that you begin to hear the stories when braver and a lot of the others were actually doing a lot more of their podcast interviews and whatnot and little things began to not add up when you look at the documents and then the executive summary comes out and i began to think wait how can the first place that douglas kurth came to my attention was in one of the original articles, it may have been the original 2015 article by Paco Chirici, my apologies if I got the wrong name, but the X-Files edition, 
where he actually was the first place that really wrote about Fravor's story. Yeah. And he mentions the Marine pilot who was sent out there first, but then was called off. And then Fravor and, and Dietrich arrived. But then in some of the documents, and I believe it was the executive summary, it described Kurth having been out there, but his testimony was when he was called and told that the other two pilots were coming in, he was already at a merge plot. We've heard that term. He was basically already over the area where they had been sending him to. Mm -hmm. So he decided to just swoop by this disturbance in the water. Since he was turning around, he was already there anyway. But then you'll realize that as it says, as he's flying away, he looks back and sees that the disturbance in the water has gone. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. He flew over it. But then according to Fravor and Dietrich's story, Fravor had his entire encounter. They saw the disturbance in the water, which got their attention. He went down towards it, saw the Tic Tac, mm -hmm. had this fly around, moved in, Tic Tac zips away. And then after that's all over, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he alleged that might have been three to five minutes from when they first arrived on the scene and saw the disturbance and he began to fly down there. But the point was, after it was over, he looks back and the disturbance in the water is cleared up. So the disturbance in the water conceivably had to have been there when they first arrived and he began to have his encounter. And if it didn't clear up until the encounter was over and Kurth could, was still close enough to look back and see that the disturbance had cleared, then Kurth had to have been pretty much right over on top of it the whole time. And so I began to, and I wrote a paper. I, I wrote a paper, just no question yeah. about this. And eventually, at some point, I have a knack for finding things, I guess. And I found an email address for Doug Kurth. And I wrote him. And to say in his I have nothing but respect for Douglas Kurth because he did respond. Awesome, <laughs> he did, awesome. He did chew on me a little bit, though. <laughs> did he? Okay. Uh, yeah. What makes you think you're so special? And it was like a slap in the face, but I don't know. He pro I mean, it sounded to me like he'd been getting hit left and right from a lot of people who wanted to hear from him. So however they found him, I don't know. I had no knowledge of it. I just found this email address and I wrote him. But I wrote him and was asking kind of these questions. And after a couple of exchanges, he, before he finally told me to leave him alone, <laughs> which don't get me wrong though, plenty of respect for Douglas Kirk because he did answer and he did clarify questions I had. Cool. But his point was he had gone out there to do a check on a, I believe if I'm saying this correctly, he'd gone out there to do a flight check on an aircraft that had been going through some, had had some work done, if that's the case. My understanding is the Marine pilots, because he was not under Fravor. He was the commander of the Marine squadron that was out there. And they were in one seaters. So my understanding is he was by himself in his plane and he had to do a check on it. And there was a flame out or some engine issue. So he didn't get a chance. To, but he had already gone out earlier than Fravor and mm -hmm. Dietrich. And Fravor and Dietrich were scheduled to do little combat scenarios, whatever they practice as they do. So they were sent out there into that area and Kurth had to wait a little bit, but since he was there, he was still there when they arrived. And yeah. so he says, I was flying, I was circling around above them the whole time. That's right. I don't know enough to know if he was in on the, my understanding is not all the pilots can hear the communication from the other pilot. They may be able to hear the carrier, but in a combat scenario, you don't want your opponent to hear your, you know, Fravor would have to clarify this or Alex Dietrich would. But my understanding is he could at least hear some of what was being said back and forth, I guess. But he was he reiterated very clearly that when they landed back on the carrier, they were still in uniform when they met on the carrier after the incident and talked about it. So Kurt was out there before all of them, I believe, and it clearly says so, he saw the disturbance in the water. Yeah. But he was, my understanding is, he was higher than Alex Dietrich. So she may have been able, of course, wing woman, she was likely able to see the, the Tic Tac you know, in Fravor's encounter. But Kurth said he did not see the Tic Tac himself with his eyes. Mm -hmm. But he was aware of the whole thing. And to me, it was, which 
not just me, everybody, everybody who looked really into this immediately began to wait, 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 Bass, Bigelow gets the Bass, OSAP, well, actually Bass, I have a different take on this stuff, but the needless to say, Kurtz, the first person you see listed as a hired by Bass, even on his LinkedIn page, which I think you were showing, it shows he had been hired by Bass at the end of 2007, when the name Bass itself, I don't believe had actually been registered until January or so a month later. But how did Kurth end up being hired at Bass? That's where I put a few things together that I, you know, the thing about being frustrated I mentioned earlier was I wrote all this stuff and I posted it on, I had a, on my own uh, website and had several articles that I had posted there. But I, I feel like, you know what? Nobody pays, nobody cares. Nobody wants to point to point out. I mean, there are a couple of points that I will tell you that because I've got enough for me to feel confident in saying it, that the whole story of the origination of Bass started with Skinwalker Ranch and Lakatsky and him talking to whomever not, not my, <laughs> not my position. On it. Good cover story, a good mm -hmm. reason to explain how Harry Reid ends up talking to Bigelow and how they decide to do something to do with UFOs. But then you have to ask, well, why was the Nimitz case suddenly their big cause celebrity? The first in principle case you hear anything about and Kurt shows up working there. Information I have is Harry Reid knew about the Nimitz case way back, at least by that was in November of 2004. Yeah. Somewhere in 2005, he's talking to Bigelow about it. So he had told Bigelow about it and a couple of other people, which is anyway. But nothing happens. You'll realize there was even a comment that for some reason it just waited until suddenly, and I think Hal Putoff has said, they got things started right in the middle around June of 2007. Wait, wait a minute, why if you knew about it in 2005, would you do nothing for two years? The iron is hot, right? In 2005, the case has just happened. Yeah. Why would you jump on it then? Why would you wait? I have, a, I have my own feelings that I thought about. I mean, at least I have a scenario that makes it logical why they did nothing. Sir, can I can uh, can I can we talk some more real quick? I'm just gonna take a quick break. If you want to take a grab some water Absolutely. or use the restroom, uh, do, do you <laughs> Absolutely. Some... You're looking very stoic, <laughs> sir. What's on? <laughs> this back on here. Uh, you said you were looking. You were looking very stoic there, sir. What was on your mind? <laughs> oh, I'm watching bombing in Kiev over there on the TV screen. Okay. Anyway, if I'm talking too much, I this is your show. You ask questions. I'll be glad if I. Get off no, I, I you're not I, interested in or no. This is that you know. People, unfortunately, I have. I'll admit that I've, I, I 100. That's something I'm dealing with. My friend made a joke. One of the Patreons of the show made a joke today about you know, like this show has a record for daily unsubscribers because the 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 you know journalism. I'm not a journalist, okay, at all by any means. But I did go to school and take some. I was an intern in New York and you know right there in. Uh, and um, uh, I got to work in 30 Rock for a little, just a short time. And I was yes. working on David Usher. Just a short time. But I worked in I worked in reality TV at the time. So I was going to school, like, much older than everyone else. And they're trying to explain TV to me. And I was like, oh, my God. I already work in the worst part of it. And it was just <laughs> – and it was – but, um, I, you know, I came to realize a lot that, you know, I'm not a journalist. But oftentimes the subjects that really require the most discussion, you know, are the ones that most people, the average – like. Just want to just want to make them puke, or just literally turn around and walk out. They don't they, they don't even want to hear too much of it. I I I have I used to do a little stand up comedy, and I, my friends that still do would say the same thing. It's like just win thirty percent of the crowd; they'll get everyone else clapping. Like literally, because you're never going to win. And like, and if you tell these people the, tr the, the if you highlight these anecdotes to anyone that already agrees that UAP means aliens, don't mess this up for us, man. We're about to meet aliens. Like that, it's. And it's it's messed up to be. And the worst part is that I have so much respect for some of the people working in this new field because of the term UAP and bringing people around. It's they think that mentioning these things um, 
because they have companies named UAP something or they have um, a podcast called the Disclosure Movement Show or or whatever it may be, they, they feel like everything is an affront to them because, hey, what, I, you know, this is what we named ourselves. We literally branded ourselves off this whole new movement. So these hard to swallow pills are, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I have no problem. I actually prefer talking about them just because all the people that do stick around want to hear the actual truth or see these actual things come to light rather than sit in the darkness forever and just never no one ever hears about them it just sucks you know, you know I, I will say uh, i i have a lot of frustration over <laughs> you know some of my brethren out there the people out there that have their beliefs and they want reassurance i mean on occasion i'll get an email from somebody who will say well their preacher told them this is really the forces of Satan and the demon horde flying around in these UFOs. And I'm like, you know, we don't have any evidence for some of the things that I tend to think might be going on. But then people will bring in their own beliefs into this. And I'm like, you know, I don't have a problem with what someone believes as long as they're not going to threaten other people to force them to adhere to that belief. Yeah. In the face of evidence to the, you know, there's a famous statement that says, you know, you can believe whatever you want. Just don't confuse it with the facts. As long as you're willing to look at the facts and change your beliefs accordingly. Truth was the truth yesterday. It'll be the truth tomorrow. If you believe something else yesterday, but the truth wasn't what you believed, then your belief's still okay. I mean, nothing fell apart. But we can't, you can't roll every everything into the mix. Whatever... Yeah. That's one of the reasons that I think some of the historical cases that I mentioned are so profound is because just the practical like funding from the military or Lockheed or some of these inventions they're coming up with, you know, if nobody builds something to not use it and the people in Congress, whoever's putting up your money, they want to go and have that wine and champagne party where you roll out the hangar doors and let's see the new aircraft that our funding got built because that's how you get more money for the next one. Mm. If it's if it's common technology, because let's face it, publish or perish, the Russians are spying on us, we're spying on them, the Chinese are spying, everybody, it's all going to come out eventually. You know, you build it and as soon as they can get their hands on one, they'll duplicate it and then it'll yeah. so if it's if it's technology that we can that what I call evolutionary. It's built on previous science and whatever else. It eventually all comes out. Yeah. If we have only one of them, I mean, if there was only one genuine object, let's say a crashed, like your story is very 51 and whatever else, I certainly wouldn't be flying it out over the ocean where it might fall in and sink to the bottom. I certainly wouldn't be flying it. I'd be flying no. it over a little if, if I was flying it at all. Yeah. In that case, you know, there's all sorts of stories we can go around oh yeah it doesn't, it doesn't deny the fact I, and unfortunately i can't do anything about what's at area 51. <laughs> they're not gonna let me in i'm yeah. sorry I'm, I'm i'm better spending my time and efforts in things that i might be able to do something about but but i don't like being lied to i don't like being shammed or gaslighted and unfortunately what i've seen in the last four years and i'm no different than other people i mean i applaud what you're doing what John Greenwald, what someone might keep Basterfield, Bob Dean, a lot of the people in ufology that are doing their best to, to dig up the information. And there are things that I didn't realize. And someone will write me an email, somebody I've never known before, writes me and says, Hey, I was curious about this. And I'm like, wait a minute, I missed that. Yeah. yeah that it happened. came out two years ago and I did not even see that document. And now you see that it fits so perfectly and it opens up a whole new view of, of things. But for the most part, we're in that 15 seconds or the next click or the next, you know, few minutes of entertainment value that people want to hear. And that's why if, if that's the case, sure, calling it a UAP, because then I can throw in anything. I can do an hour long ancient alien show <laughs> and roll in everything I want, as long as whatever I can show you, I can say some experts believe yeah. blah, blah, you know, and that, okay, somebody's got to make well, right, but still. You, you're, you're spot on there. And, and, and just to, for the, I mean, th this is, th this part of the UAP story is real in which 
technically speaking, whenever Lou or any of these other people say UAP in the context in which they use a sentence with a initialism UAP is in it, um, they're being kind of truthful, except in the market they're delivering in it, the context and that is completely bogus. Like for years now, you can follow the contracts for, you, you know, counter UAS systems. They've li like literally the last 25 to almost 30 years, there is an evolution of how to knock drones out of the sky. And of course, I don't think that, the, you know, the drones are the answer for the, you know, especially from, I could tell you stories from my childhood with multiple witnesses that literally changed me for life. You know, I, forever, literally, I can never, I almost every day I think about them still today. I, I, you know, even my mother was witness to one of them that I, we just said the air force is going to have a new stealth bomber one day and we, we've seen it first and, but never, it never came, you know? So, but, um, Anyways, it's just there is that I, I, I'm trying actually to prevent myself from going on to a long tangent about this, but it's almost impossible. Um, the 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 we I've watched personally, um, and I'm actually kind of directly, kind of in some way, anecdotally speaking, related to what I think has happened in the Nimbus encounter. My own personal belief. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's impossible that it it couldn't have been humans, but there's. When I say that, there, I, I put little, um, I put an asterisk on it because I, what I think has happened is essentially speaking, whenever anyone tells me they see a disturbance in the water and then they see something move that defying the laws of physics, I can look at it one of two ways. And, and part of me absolutely, you know, knows there's something f fantastical happening that has nothing to do with our own military. I mean, I just, I, I'm positive of it, though I can never confirm it for anyone else but myself and the people that were with me. But at the same time, I've noticed that since 2003, a man named Garner and a series of other scientists that have worked from, from, from everyone from Lockheed to General Dynamics and Raytheon, all these other organizations, have produced these uh, uh, laser arrays that make any aircraft they want in the air that that can show up visually. Can does you can't tra can't capture or you can't uh, shoot it. Obviously, it's it's not real. Uh, but it's a, a plasma blob that makes, you know, and, and I'm sure you've heard plasma in the past. You know, it's come around in multiple conspiracies is the answer. Well, Bob Lazar didn't see that. He saw plasma being developed, all this stuff. But the problem is, is that is that along with the countermeasures to knock drones out of the sky, you know, other measures have had to been invented to move on past then. And, you know, not that I believe truly that's the answer. I, I just stay open. I will say that like for every step of drone progression, including long range drones that power themselves by flying. And even though that sounds ridiculous, it's, you know, DARP articles about it today. Um, almost every part of it seems to like being accounted for all the way up to where they start using plasma ghost as, uh, as, as, um, as another way to d deter. Cause at first the, the drone was going to deter a, a, a missile from hitting the aircraft. Like that was one of the countermeasures. And so, and, you know, e even if it's just, even if what we're doing is replicating what we've seen UFOs or uh, aliens quote unquote do, um, th I think there's way more to what's going on here because I worked for a DARPA program called Land Warrior while I was in the, when, the, when I was in the army and uh, it was about heads up display. You know, we've, we've worked on the original heads up displays. It's, they were invented back in 87. And um, these heads-up displays, since they were acknowledged, and of course only one nation really had the ability to work with them, but it wasn't soon long after before where we just started selling different versions of heads-up displays to countries all over the world. Of course, countries don't have as good of counterintelligence operations as us. So suddenly we find those things are espionage. Gets, they get all the information almost instantly from any country we give the stuff to because the Chinese can steal things like overnight and they're great at it. And um, so we... But literally everything from contracts to drop drones out of the sky to countermeasures to stop drones and to replace drones and 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 um you know just recently i find out that no one's talking about the fact that i think a few of the pilots were using something very unique at the time uh novel equipment very special and it was probably supported with ai even back in 2004 and it has to do with the heads-up display but it doesn't necessarily have to do with a helmet it could have been like an implant and neuro neuro like they literally like they were they were talking about how do you if you can use augmented reality on the battlefield today how can you stop it you have to put targets or interference in the way of it at first it was like well let's use emp but that's you know emp can be found in nuclear you know emp is not uh exotic whatever but what they found was introducing augmented reality targets was a great way to like mess with these systems they were talking about it like a long time ago and 
I, I remember like people from Augustine Consulting Group talking about, well, what happens if someone, some enemy encounters a land warrior unit like mine, you know, like the ghost, Tom Clancy's ghost recon thing with a, I think that was my unit, you know, and, and it, what happens when it, when an enemy figures out a way to really start messing with that system where it's augmented and, and you see that they were using augmented reality and, and holographic reality all the way back in 2002 and three and four Navy patents for it all the way back in 2004, you start to wonder, you know, and again, I'm not saying that there's no, this is the hard part. I keep having to go back and say this because the world's gone crazy. I think personally we're copying something or we, we have something that helped us along that made some of these leaps, uh, um, not necessarily a Philip Corso's story or anything, but it just, it seems to me the Nimitz encounter is far, like whether we agree or not or what's going on there at all, but it seems to me the Nimitz encounter is being manipulated or coerced in a way to want us to, to believe it's one thing when, there's anecdotal evidence to support the other where there's basically no evidence other than fantastical cases like my personal ones or others that have been reported in first-hand witness encounters and some data like radar returns and stuff like that that show anything that we can really quantify. Oh, actually, I take that back. When AI scans the like the KUFOS files and all the major archives in the world, maybe we'll see patterns that we don't know about yet that, may, that can help us. But I don't know. Something deep down tells me that... that some of the stuff that happened in the Nimitz encounter that they refuse to talk about today uh, is is one of the main topics of the story. Like the major, it's not the aircraft. Everyone wants new propulsion all the time, which is great. That's awesome. That seems like to be the only focus in ufology is new exotic propulsion. That, that's the next replacement to everything. But it's really putting on these new dynamic electronic warfare systems on current platforms. Like Biden just ordered 100 B2 spirits. Jesus, Christ. it's 2022. Excuse my language there, but uh, it's 2022. I just feel like, well, you know, and there's the thing. I mean, I try to always, you know, keep in the back of my mind the, the idea that the simple Occam's razor, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. My thinking is if you can find an explanation that's workable, that puts it into the camp of human technology, whether it's the air, you know, no matter whether I have to ask, well, why would you want to test that 150, 200 miles, whatever it was off the coast of California in a battle group where the planes, some of them, it seems like may very well have some kind of live ammo, even if it's not air to air missiles. Yeah. Well, you need to now, but just because I don't understand doesn't mean somebody might not have wanted to for some other reason. You know, yeah, maybe there was some other intelligence operation because I mean, it sounds like a spy novel here. But if you thought somebody <laughs> might be observing our aircraft carrier Nimitz, you know, uh, practice sessions going on and you could throw this in there, knowing our pilots would react just the way a witness would react. And you're really letting their realistic response feed in to uh, that, whatever that little project is or whatever you were doing that you really were just trying to impress upon somebody else. This is For like, some reason you, yeah, I, I you know your spot that, that is the, what you just said right there, sir, is like they see uh, this. This is why I stay away from that, that term. Uh, like, uh, oh, that question of why, uh, you would because everyone always jumps to you're going to risk the lives of pilots in this test, but the pro well, one thing is if it was a holographic or or electronic kind of measure, they wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have been any danger. Second thing is yeah. you always test your best equipment against your best. That's quite literally how the military rules. That's, I mean, the, that's our standard operating procedure for everything. Like, you know, we're not going to go blast each other in the face with tanks or something, but literally yeah, we course. go out there and have battle. Like we, we challenge our allies. I used to work at the foreign student training detachment. It was hilarious to see some of these soldiers come over here and they've only ever held an AK-47 and an RPG their entire career. And they see what we're using and they're like, this is like, you know, this is like, this is Star Trek. You know, like what the hell is going on right now? This is crazy. And, you know, and, back, and, to go back even to the Paul Benowitz today, the whole idea we hear these days of directed energy. Yes. Well, yes. there was all the way back to, at Kirtland. There was a little place or a branch there because I actually saw a photo and then suddenly that article was gone off the web of what they called a man portable laser. But the directed energy directorate was started right there on the other side of the fence from where Paul was. <clears throat> and they called it the scorp works because a scorpion stings because obviously you get hit with a 
you know, nowadays they use the area denial ones that look like on the top of a Humvee, you've got a big squarish looking antenna. Yeah, microwave gun. Microwave yeah. that just heats up the surface of your skin and clears <laughs> the area fast. Oh, I know. But yeah. This picture was a guy holding look like a Star Trek phaser rifle thing because there's no miss. You pull that trigger, boom, the speed of light, that thing's, there's no air, wind drag, whatever. You know, you put a mm. laser right where you're pointing at. But you don't hear any more about it today. I, yeah. I think one of the, I think one of the appendices in my own book, I wrote a little bit about that because I thought it might have had some pertinence to the idea of some things Paul had been talking about that he was getting hit at times, and he thought, well, it was aliens or something. But these things would hit you and put these little marks on them, and that's when I realized later, well, wait, 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 you got the directed energy directorate right across the fence, so to speak, and he's getting these strange things. Uh, you know, uh, you know what? It's it's not unbelievable at all. So I'm telling you, I I you know I was on Future Weapons, uh, the TV show with Mac Macowitz. He's he's passed away now, but he um he had on the microwave gun or the recent version of. It. I try to explain to people. Listen to me. I this is a promise. Now not with everything. I can't be 100 percent, of course. But but anytime you see something that fantastic on the roof of a Humvee, anywhere near the infantry grunt like myself, even from a small and unconventional unit, um. We're basically no different from civilians. That means it's been in a, a, a high-speed CIA unit for probably 20, 30 years. And the CIA has the best military. It's not the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force. It's the CIA. They have the best of the best. They hire all the retiring best of the best and from the Army anyways. And um, and so you start to see this, this pattern of what's been accounted for. And it's not – I personally don't believe that it's – I mean, we obviously there was that uh, – with that place in France where – um, after World War II, they found out what the hell they were doing with these sonic type of things. They weren't quite sure what the Nazis were trying with them, like the, these these big speaker-looking things, essentially. And it never really worked according to them. But the idea was sound. You know, you could pretty much use direct energy to knock aircraft out of the sky, and people would be absolutely confused about the idea of it. And it's at, you at, you have to fill in the blank, if you will. It's suddenly magic. A magic has hit you, burning yeah. your skin off. And that's where, you, and I don't want to get too deep into the crazy conspiracies of what the government actually has, but I will say that even something you just brought up, like I've heard direct quotes from people that I think have been friends with Kit Green for, or known Kit Green personally for a long time to say that like things like the Corrales incident was in fact human technology being tested on an island people right on the edge of the water so we could duck out of there when we needed to right away. And so when you hear statements like that, you're like, we have lasers that can go through walls that leave little holes in your skin and burn people like what the hell you know you, you don't know i start to really i mean believe me i mean if if oh waterboarding was such a sensitive thing <laughs> you have something like what you're talking and i mean everybody understands what waterboarding is just but something that you're talking about the technology to do something like that is that double-edged sword of yeah you've got it but the <laughs> human impact of realizing you're going to actually use that on people or you might have already been using them. It's almost like the Jason Bourne kind of a thing. It's so horrible to think of doing it. You don't want to admit you've been doing it, but then you need to use it because it really works. So how do you, I, you know, but that's, that's why to me, I mean, all of this stuff is fascinating to talk about, but when it comes back to the, the UFO subject, you know, my thinking is, <laughs> We need to get our thinking up so that we focus on what we're talking about here, whether, you know, I mean, actually, I, I'm of the opinion that ufology or the people who really are interested in this enough, especially if you go back and look at the historical cases where you think, okay, we probably didn't have this technology back yes, then. Yes, yeah, exactly. So if somebody like, you know, the, you know, the Papua New Guinea case or the coin helicopter encounter or Lonnie Zamora or Valenzuel, France, or any number yeah. of these cases where it wasn't just something at a distance. It was something right in their face, so to speak, and way before we probably had the technology for it. <laughs> the reality is the government has never told us about it before, and they probably are not going to have, I mean, I hate to say this, I'm from my own perspective, if I was them, I wouldn't tell anybody until I had to. So Absolutely. I mean, there was no way around it. Why set the bomb off 
early if you're going to have to just admit to it. So I'd be, and especially because you're at least trying to get as far ahead technologically as you can, since you are trying to protect your, you know, our, our country from whatever else. But from the standpoint of people in, let's say, ufology, whatever. We need to change our approach. We need to go find them. It's mm. be like, if you're, you know, if you are a native in the apocalypto kind of scenario, if you're a native down there, but the Spaniards, the empire is only going to talk to your king and you're just the guy on the beach and you're oh, not gosh. the king. You're never getting involved in that. And they're, you matter, maybe it's best for you to just stay on the beach and go talk to the guys who are sitting by the life, by the boat, waiting for the big, big wigs to come back. Because the big weeks can make all the arrangements they want over here, but the people that are out there who really want to know what's going on, I mean, the government's not going to come and tell me what's going on. I no. know there's, for whatever reason, they're spinning this thing, and the public is eventually going to just kind of go back to sleep or go back to the woo woo thing. But honestly, I think there's you know, a couple of, you know, Abby Loeb's idea is a good one. I'm just not sure how. You, if you're looking at telescopes at things, even in near Earth orbit, unless it's got the U.S. logo or the, <laughs> the flag or the Chinese flag. And if I was a Chinese, the first thing I'd be doing now is paint it black, make it look like a disc, because I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I, hopefully their thinking is a, as good no. as mine and they'll be some way around it. But to me. You know, the UAP expedition is an idea. I'm not sure how you're going to find things under the water, but I'm, they don't talk to me, so I'm sure they, they're thinking along this line. But even back in the day of things like Project Starlight that Ray Stanford had going or things that you hear about today, there needs to be, I mean, the, the people who are interested in this need to find a way, hey, make it a commercial venture if you need to. That seems to always bring in the bucks. Look what Avi Loeb, the minute he starts talking to this, somebody shows up at his door and offers him this money to do it. But, you know, there's, I just think there needs to be a different approach than just hoping for disclosure, waiting for somebody else. You know, that's yeah. saying hoping is just waiting for somebody else to do it. <laughs> I think it's time to make a oh change. Oh my God, I hate hope. <laughs> I talk, it's like a theme on the show. People get so mad at me, but I talk about the time like hope isn't good. You know what hope is? Hope is a replacement substance when you are, uh, when something that you actually need isn't is absent <laughs> it's like this I mean, it's not you know, great yeah, i mean it, being positive you know people call hope is just being positive that's fine but oh is that what they say i don't even famous, know there's a famous statement do not confuse movement with action hmm. things need to be done if we're going to find out what's going on who these whoever's flying these things that i consider the real phenomenon yeah the real reason we're all talking about this is not because there are some drones flying around their Navy carriers out there and that we don't know where they came from. That's, you know, to me, if it looks like a drone or if it could have been a drone or if it's a who knows what, you know, I'm not, you can't do anything with it. No. But, but at the same time, to go back to the whole idea of Paul Benowitz and everyone else involved, the reality is if we, if we allow or just ignore citizens, people out there, just like you and me, everyday average good American citizens who are interested in this, don't ask me how I got into this. It's just, I grew up with it, right? So, but if this happens to be my area of interest, it irks me to think that, especially with people like Richard Doty out there now talking about acting like, oh, well, you know, this was done to a whole lot of, or we had a whole lot of people doing this. So I, I just had this feeling if it was Paul Benoit was my father, I'd be pretty bitter about this whole thing to think that there's some guy out there who's walking around. And, but if we don't stand up for Paul, you know, if we don't expect a little bit better of ourselves now, I mean, really the whole thing with the disclosure and the UAP task force and all this sort of thing, I think there should be some organization in ufology where they get together and 
go to the Justice Department and let's have some, you know, for example, 22 million supposedly came from our taxpayer dollars money to pay for the OSAP contract, which led to all this investigation and reporting or whatever became of that. But then because it's through the subcontractor, we're not entitled to see those results. What about the database? They created a database that Jacques Vallée built, which tied into the MUFON stuff. That was our taxpayer dollar money. Why don't we have a right to see that? Why should somebody be able to use our dollars? It's not like the CI using their budget to build their own stuff, which, okay, <laughs> we don't have mm -hmm. any real, even justified reason for that. But it seems like everybody just sits around and thinks next time it'll be different. <laughs> or we're going to have disclosure now, and we have Lou Elizondo and everybody talking and everybody uses the word disclosure and acting like, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, they talk about the film. People don't stop and realize there apparently was a real film. Braver actually apparently did get a film. Alex Dietrich said he got it, the, got the film and slammed the door to their carrier and they, and made copies of his gun camera film. But we're presented with the Fleur video, which was a technically Underwoods, although we don't really have any evidence that's Underwoods either. There's nothing on there that says Chad Underwood. Right, all right. We were just given this video that was either came from, and a couple of other ones that are just little dots. And well, that would be that, awesome. <laughs> if you had a video, that'd be great. I mean, God, that would that'd be... That, yeah, that, it's, there, I mean, it's there somewhere. <laughs> There's but, parts of that story, though, that still don't, they still, I mean, what about the confiscation, alleged confiscations uh, from Air Force personnel? What about, you know, um, yeah. you know, there, there's, uh, there's, all, there's all, you know, as well, like the technology, too, we, do, we simply just don't even know. And and, uh, and as well, how about, nah, I didn't want to, I don't even want to harp on it because I feel like well, that's all I know, do is, uh, it, it's just, it's, sorry, go ahead. I mean, it's a valid, you brought up the statement before when we were talking about special projects that, if there was some project being carried out for a purpose we don't understand, whether it had to do with holographic imagery or something else going on, and whoever was running it was doing it to be able to either justify some funding request or whether it was the CIA or somebody else was doing this to show that it could be done, you might want to send your guys out right afterwards and remove all of that data off the ships. Because that's the data you're going to use to justify and prove that your program or your project worked. Hmm. But you don't want to leave it sitting there for anybody else to be spreading it around. That's a good so point. Was it, could it have, you know, was it real UFO reasons they were taking it out of there? Or was there some other justifiable reasons that they knew to get out there that quickly? Which like Fravor and the others have suggested that the captain of the ship didn't seem overly excited. Nobody on the ship seemed to be overly concerned about the fact that he just had an encounter with something he hadn't seen. And he comes back to the ship and they go sit there and waiting and nobody from the intelligence center comes to talk to them. Hmm. Maybe there was something going on or maybe somebody knew something. I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I just I, I just know that those that, that there's something there's something interesting that, that that needs to be looked into that Garner scientist I haven't even really looked into him that deep other than the fact that a series of holographic patterns that go all the way back to CRT the creation of CRT monitors um, and in uh, finds his way back having naval patents again and I looked up where those patents would be today and the only thing I could find other than the fact that when they were first coming around was these are going to be great for training you know what I mean and, and right now actually they're used in law enforcement some of them what they do is they, they literally hostage situation, picture a hostage situation, guys on the roof of a building, a bunch of hostages. They, they can send a ball of light, a, a orb, a huge bright glowing orb up to the roof and transform it into, into a, a, like the, the God of his choice and have it say, this is officer Sanford. So from LA County, please, they pump sound waves right into it. And I can actually show you a video right now, if you'd like uh, of the, of the actual orb doing that, which is, um, um, uh, I mean, I, it makes me think of some of the displays that I've seen recently where people are actually able to take drones out there and orchestrate them to form yeah. figures and things. And I guess up against the night sky, you could make it look like lights on a disc or lights on an airplane or a pl whole plane flying by or any advertising, you know, whatever they want to do. 
it's it's right. the future that future is swarm uh swarm uh drones swarm, as well yeah, that, that term is being yeah. and, and it's not even and we just instantly put it to like well like drones like we know but like swarming around or something out of the back of an aircraft to do something but ultimately speaking they're gonna you know decentralizing any network is going to be so great and and uh and you know darpa had that one airman uh you know fly a, five different jets with his mind just like four years ago with a neural implant. And they put that put paper out to show uh, first a series of paraplegics. They did it with in a simulator. Yeah. And I said, well, let's try it with a real pilot. But I mean, that to me, we're on a whole new level of, of what the countermeasure is for then that, I mean, everything has a countermeasure or a, a, an attempt, at least for years. It's, 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 you know, for years there's cruise missiles until there's, bomblets, uh, tinfoil boon, balloon, self-inflating bomblets that spread all over the battlefield. Oftentimes have spheres inside of them. You've heard that a few times. Um, so there's all these countermeasures. So I don't know if that's just one of a, a, of many, but I'm trying to find this video for you, for you. Sorry, real quick, before I let you go. I've had you on for a while. Thank you for that's hanging out right. so long. Uh, you know, the whole security thing is, I mean, I have a background in IT and computer technology and I have you know, certification in computer security and whatever. And just getting that and now the things that, you know, I get <laughs> Google feeds articles on security, you know, viruses and everything else that the yeah. Russians hacking, whoever. And you realize, you know what? There is no security at all because it's not just you anymore. I mean, if I'm the government or Microsoft, I'm worried about targeted groups of hackers, not just the lone hackers out here doing things. The average person is left at the whim of trusting that your antivirus people are on top of it or Microsoft or Apple or whoever's on top of this and trying to keep you out of trouble. I mean, in that, like, you know, you almost just best not plug your computer into anything because, but then now, now they're looking at updates that, you know, Microsoft sends out because some of the updates end up with hacked stuff that you get and you think you're updating something just to be safe, but indirectly, even that's already got Trojan information packaged into it. So I don't know. Security is it's a concept <laughs> I, I honestly it's that it's that it, that that um I'm, i don't know why i'm having such a hard time I'll, I'll send it to you for sure if i can't find it right now but it's it's they put it on military.com of all websites which i thought was hilarious but they they make this orb to literally show up and talk and the idea was that first responders could use it to, to calm down people i mean it's it has its origins in the bay and pigs invasion like the idea of projecting an image on a cloud you know and and there's no way Jesus could be communist. That's literally what my, my concern is this kind of ability to do this, or even now we hear about with different frequency waves projecting sounds that the person thinks are coming from inside their own head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ideas, or at that point, it gets to where now it's not just a matter of you're worried about somebody hacking your computer, but are those thoughts your own thoughts? Are you That's thinking right. it's like inception? You plant this idea <laughs> yes. as the person thinks it's their own idea. Oh, Lord. And at some point, it's like we're all going to be wearing tinfoil hats, <laughs> trying to avoid our own people, not just the aliens. <laughs> they, you know, I wrote down while you were talking earlier, actually, I wrote down uh, while I was listening to what you said. And I, I said, uh, I wrote, um, by the time humanity actually cares about something other than ourselves long enough, the powers that be. Will be no different from no no more indist, uh, indistinguishable from the aliens themselves. You know, like literally, like we're apathetic to all of this, and no one really cares about the truth long enough. Where like the uh, like the uh, oh, what's her name? Oh my God, the Carol Rosen conspiracy with Warner Warner Von Brown there about them eventually using the term aliens as a. And, you know, honestly, you, if they wanted to right now, they could go crash a flying saucer out in the desert right now if they if they wanted to in some way, jettison it out, you know, and, and what would happen? The story would, it would never contain itself. You know, you don't put the paperwork on, you turn off your transponder on the aircraft, you throw it out the back of, and next thing you know, you've got this mystery forever. And, well, there's no pilots. Where'd it come from? With a melting ice sheet, you just leave something buried up there. And oh, there you go. Halfway off of it, and everybody thinks it's been there for a thousand years. Oh. It's got to be alien. Yeah, it's the market archaeological. I remember reading a, or seeing a program back in the day about propaganda and how when Hitler first came into power, one of the first things his propaganda minister did was to crank up the public radio production so every family could have a radio. Mm -hmm. Because the point was, then he could pump, pump their propaganda over the radio into every house, 
and you wouldn't realize that you're getting it because you're listening to music and everything else, but then it's just a convenient way to make yeah. darn sure you're getting it. Now with the internet, if you want to control people, hell, Facebook has enough algorithms to be able to tell you what specifically a person is into and is interested or might maybe believes, and you're just going to present the prop propaganda in such a way that it peaks. We didn't even have to talk about the Proud Boys and all of those kinds of things that are going on out there. But the idea that you could have your brand, like I said earlier, you know, you're going out to a party at the club and everybody has their own mixed drink or their own flavor of belief that they want to believe in. And you twist it to either put two parties against each other or make one side to the other. And it's hmm. the truth is the, the truth is the toughest thing going because you're not going to be able to recognize I guess we have that same thing today when it comes to the UFO phenomenon. Most people are willing to throw the term UAP in there because then anything goes. Yeah. But it but it doesn't. That's the whole point. I mean, well, the, the truth has nothing to do with uh, honest uh, honesty. It seems they seem like one can simply surround themselves with uh, you know confirmation entirely, like you were saying earlier. And I yeah, just I always say this too, like don't don't worry if anyone says anything bad to you, folks. Marginalize them before they even speak. That way, you can already assume that everything they say is bad or not. That's how society works now. We literally that's yeah. well, that's but, the whole idea with Paul Benowitz. That's the whole idea we have yeah. to this day. You have honestly, I suspect that. There are a lot of podcasts that are put up out there. It's like you for the story you mentioned the CIA, that the CIA would send some of their people to intern at the media agencies, the big news agencies, to oh, learn yeah. how news can be put together and put out that can modify the public's perception. Well, if you've got enough podcast people out here that you can then bring in the people you want to put on and make darn sure it's a bro fest, everybody loves and you know, but your people don't go talk on the other podcasts where they might get hard questions put to them. Then everybody feeds into what they want to believe. And, what, and I, you know, I don't know. These That's days it's just frustrating because it's getting to the, to that point where. Well, did their work? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but did, 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 I wonder then if they're, if this whole movement or whatever it was worked, if it was the, if it was to get UAP in the, uh, in the political sector by by the way i think it's hilarious that rubio is one of the guys like the guy literally wants to bomb every nation that we've ever mentioned and they're like he's like we might do something venezuela he like instantly looks over at the people that have been paying his super pack you know the bomb makers but um here's uh, one of the videos right here of, the um, scientists have finished testing on an early weapon that can make laser plasma balls talk stop or we will be forced to fire upon you. It's called the, the laser. Now, I can't stand the rest of the video, and that's just the little wow. part I want to show. It's really ridiculous, but the rest oh, of the video yeah, gets... I'll look it up. I can, it, I'll find it for the time. Ju just picture the idea that uh, an aircraft no longer needs to fire flares out of it. That's it. Yeah. Fla flare, uh, um, uh, uh, focused laser plasma flares have been in development for longer than anyone knows. Certainly, back with some of these famous cases where we just see like this glowing ball in the sky, and everyone goes, "What the hell?" Of course, not like way back. I'm talking like you know early '90s and stuff. But, um, but it, it goes to sh like the idea is that they no longer require flares; they're just going to put these out as they fly, anyways. Where you know, uh, when the infantry gets cer a cl certain range to enemy territory, we call we go into what's called bounding Overwatch. Well, the pilots are no different than are in these fighting squadrons. Is that they they get to a certain point where they have to, every maneuver is perfectly planned to reduce their signatures they you know the, the how loud they are and whatnot so um and these things will then jettison out and just be constantly out there so that a missile would run into them anytime way before it would get near the afterburners or the the plume yeah. of the aircraft and that's uh, and someone thought of that Crazy. but but what would happen if you saw that well before you knew plasma balls balls and that's just one little side of it that little talking part of it but before that you would see things like the phoenix lights and stuff and assume that that what you're seeing has to be in i'm not again i have no idea what really went down there or whatever but that's right in the time frame where these things started coming about the idea of using flares was too unpredictable you know like you you necessarily didn't always work and we've seen that dramatized in movies and stuff and and so a series of countermeasures came about and now the chinese are running these stupid cartoons i think they're hilarious they're awful cute but uh they in their national papers they're uh uh the national media sources they're of a jet f flying in the south china sea over taiwan and american ships come and launch something at it and it shoots out all these other aircrafts underneath it 
the same size of itself. It's like a ghost aircraft all around it. Seriously. Because it can, the laser array can turn it into any shape it wants. You can literally make it into the shape of, of, of the deity they believe in all the way to an aircraft that, that you want to show up on on your God. it's it's gone nuts Crazy. and so and, and and now we are stuck in the position i i always like god my experiences as a child were you know they shook my babysitter who was eight ten years older than me we saw something wild then my friends we all saw this thing my mother didn't believe the damn word about ufos when i grew up even though we watched star trek until she saw something happen right overhead and i know those cases of what i hold on to as being i think the real deal like the real deal, holy field. There is thing that this world is not as we know it. Having said that, the most clever species on this planet that we know of right now is the is the one that constantly loves to blow each other up and always needs to find new and better ways to prevent that or make it worse for you know. Yeah, that's a sad commentary on us, but it's it, true. Oh, <laughs> it's <laughs> sick. It's sick, and I I, I don't want to go all straight cynical, but it is. Like, and I am, I, I still consider myself a patriot. Like, if, if we got invaded, I would probably drop what I'm doing, even though I am retired and go go back and do what I do. But having said that, um, there is a line, like you said in the beginning, there is a, we, we could be discussing right now entire uh, structure changing technology that could legitimately re etch the, you know, the human story and what it means to like have an impact on our environment or whatever. But, you know, I think that old adage about the powers that be, you know, they, they pay the bills oftentimes, you know, they, 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 those contracts are in place for a reason. Um, and I don't know if necessarily swapping out our entire infrastructure where, where we have people that are growing in power around us all the time that want to kind of get back in power would be a smart idea. And cl plus that getting in the hands of the enemy, that'd be nuts. That'd be nuts. It'd be like giving them a nuclear fusion reactor you can fit in a in the trunk of your car and then you see what happens they're going to do something crazy with it and uh yeah i don't know I, I you know i don't want to rant forever with you but i i just i feel like let me get a bottom line from you sir let me get a bottom line for you i'll hit, I'll hit, I'll hit this with you now i know this is just oh, speculation no, bottom line on what <laughs> this is just speculation i know it um paul Benowitz was probably seeing some sort of agreement or something where some something was flying in something unexplained was flying in and landing right where the security guards were seeing it and being okay with it it was you don't no, think it had not security guards seeing it is the question they're, oh there you don't know if they were the, seeing it. well the point was the first when he first saw them and i'll make it short here the, my understanding is when he first saw them when he was up on his roof he just saw these odd glows that would appear kind of already down on the ground out there didn't know what they were but then when they shot up about 300 feet boom he said they lit up like you'd expect to hear an explosion coming across the prairie but mm. there was no sound at all boom jump up 300 feet shoot off south around the corner of the mountain gone but then one of the nights when he got out there earlier and his wife was out there with him i think on, on, on this one night where they could tell where these things were but they saw some lights that looked like the lights of one of the guards or a jeep someplace maybe coming by and from their angle, of course, keep in mind, I think he was about a, two miles away from looking the distance in the dark. Right. They thought, how can the things go by there and not see these things? Now, I don't know if you're out there, maybe if you're looking one direction and not the other, or maybe if you're higher or lower. But the question always was, and one night he described, and he wrote about this and that stuff he sent to me. He said it looked clearly to him like somebody was out there walking on the ground, around the ground, beneath one of these things with a flashlight or some kind of bright beam because you can kind of see like a beam playing around. The point was these things would come in and sit right. down there in the dark, sometimes for seemingly hours at a time. Now, I had a friend who'd been in the military once before who <laughs> I talked about this and had just made the suggestion that in you know the cases of people who are hired or as guards who have or living in Albuquerque and are now have a, you know, guarding the mountains, that you get some very dedicated people who, if you tell them you've got a pro project coming in and things are going to be down there and you're to just do nothing, that they'll do yeah. it. They're yeah. good with it. So the guards, whether they knew something was going on, but they were just okay, told yeah. to ignore it, or whether they were never aware, I don't know. It was just, oh. there was no reaction, no alarms, which is what eventually Paul began to think. Does he say nothing or does he call the base and at least tell them what he's seen that's so, that's the part that sticks with me very uh that that resonates with me because that's like to me that uh, did do you think paul his 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 thoughts were that 
you know that oh no you obviously you know that he you know he called the he called the base because he thought that they weren't noticing these things were happening there now do you, the, the, he was only reinforced with that idea because they they confirmed that for him because wouldn't if it was a secret operation or there was a secret agreement going on with something over there and that person was actually there for those things that he would have just said you know i didn't see him of course so that well so, and that's and there's the thing to me you know he had a company it's still there thunder scientific doing well apparently his sons are running it and they had my well, understanding is company had contracts with the different branches of the military for um measuring oh, really? and barometric some oh, okay. things right there across the gate from kirtland so I, I would have thought somebody could have gone to him and said paul 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 gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got this stuff you need to be quiet we'll make sure you've got you know whatever you want to i mean i'm guessing here but you know see i mean somebody might have gone and said something i don't know what was said but for some reason, looking at it in hindsight, with everything that was has come out and with everything that's been said, and the fact that, you know, in a way, you think, why is Richard Doty still talking? Ernest Edwards retired and I think went on with his life. Yeah. Why is Doty still out pushing the whole story that it was either, I don't know, aliens or it was. They were concerned about the Russian spies, whatever stories you know he's been out there pushing. But apparently from the get go, I never have had any. I've never heard any indication and never was told anything by Paul at all that anybody ever came to him and said, hey, would you do us a favor and just shut the up? No, do nothing. Apparently, they just fed him the idea that it must be aliens. And Edwards had told me later and the idea that they took helicopters and my thinking, this is just my thinking was once they realized Paul had already had an interest in things going on in the Dulce Archelita Mesa area, which maybe there were some peculiar things up there, but it was probably not out of reach to consider implanting the idea that there are some strange things in the mountains going ground. And apparently Edwards told me after this meeting that took place, a couple of helicopters went up to the Archelita Mesa area. He didn't know who was in them, but he told me that after that October, whatever, November meeting on base, some helicopter, somebody got in a big helicopters and flew up to that area. And Doty has commented that they fly Paul up there and say, we don't know what those things are. It looked like things in the ground, whatever. Now, my, fe my feeling is either, A, they're trying to get him, you know, redirect his attention away from Kirtland. Right, right. But also, since there was a whole lot of mythology and woo woo stuff going on cattle relations they could if he talked about it and they plant that idea that there's aliens maybe underground yeah and he says that to anybody boom <laughs> that's so far out of that I, yeah maybe, maybe they were hoping that he'd be talking up and they would so confabulate everything that nobody's going to pay attention to him and i probably could have just hung up the phone and thought yeah this guy's out there. If he hadn't, if I hadn't asked him, he hadn't said he had these films. And when I saw the films, that's when I knew <laughs> these oh, were man. not just little lights. You know, this yeah. was something else that he saw. But I don't know how to account for it. In 1980, we've seen nothing. I mean, at, since. at the same time as well, though, I do, you know, in, def in defense of the Air Force, I love that it said that's <laughs> in defense of the Air Force. Um, you know, there was a kind of a period, and not that I am I, fully knowledgeable, but there was seems like there was a period where they were kind of open, you know, at a point to this. I mean, when you look at Blue Book in the beginning, it doesn't, or you know, that what or other other studies, it doesn't necessarily seem like they were entirely entirely close to the to the idea. And even Betty and Barney Hill talked about spending time on the Air Force Base after their encounter and their friends there, and they discussed it, and they seemed very open to it. And and you know, but at the and, and of course, we have so many damn anecdotal stories of alleged UFOs visiting Air Force bases or something, doing something like that. So, so in defense of the Air Force, maybe they were just like, well, I guess what's that's what they are. We'll monitor or whatever. But but then you see what spun out afterwards, and it's just like, well, are we just going through it today? I hate to keep overlaying it on top of each other, but at, at, it seems like every time that someone from the government allegedly is telling someone about aliens it is directly involved with some sort of secret of ours that is so secret it's again you know it could detriment to national security or something like that so whatever that may be i think we'll never know <laughs> but um like i said before it's a you know it's certainly um 
Uh, I didn't say it. Terrence McKenna said it of all people. He said the whole entire stu human story is uh, is the turning from an ape into a flying saucer. Where I sometimes feel that way. It just feels, for God's sakes, well, weird. It, you know, if, uh, people want to believe what they want. You know, you give them whatever will keep them happy, and in many cases, make them go away. <laughs> they go away happy. Maybe that's what happened. And the whole UFO thing to me, though has become a victim of its own definitive term. If you just use the term unidentified or unknown, then it's like we mentioned those TV programs where then it's anything goes. Yeah. Now suddenly you'll have people talking about Bigfoot and orbs and who knows what, and it's fairies and it's because, and everything gets thrown in there. How can you do, you know, at least in science, when you try to formulate an experiment, you have to design it so that the result you get can be attributed specifically to that thing you were trying to measure or to understand. You can't have an experiment that's so wide open that the results could have been explained by any number, you know, of different things. Yeah. But then it's the whole UFO phenomena, you're going to end up with a lot of people whose treasure beliefs are going to crash and burn if they have to suddenly come back to say, well, how does that really relate? Bigfoot, maybe there's something to it. I don't think it has a darn thing to do with UFOs. I mean, yeah. at least what I think of as UFOs, so to speak. Could there be any number of other things out there? Maybe. That's fine. But, you know, I mean, I had an analogy once before, you know, you have somebody who's going to go out and they're going to catch this mysterious fish. And you say, really, what does it look like? So nobody knows. That's why it's mysterious. And you keep asking questions. It reminded me of a Carl Sagan analogy at the beginning of a, of a demon haunted world, if you want to read a superb book. But the whole idea is, if, and his idea was, if you can't really give any definitive descriptive characteristics that identify what you're looking for from what else you're not looking for, how are you ever going to know if you find it? If you don't have some characteristics of that fish that'll let you know that's it. Yeah. Then every time you catch one, you're going to think, well, maybe this must not have been it. And you keep going forever. On the one hand, it's a great adventurous thing to not ever stipulate. But that's, that's not, you know, this is, this is not the phenomenon that I'm interested in. I mean, gotcha. I don't know what, I don't know what Paul Benowitz saw, but the reaction, what happened to him, what's been recorded Dodie and everybody else saying to Paul was not fair. Whether it was our device or not, whether I might understand, he should have just, they could have told him and he'd yeah. you know, just let it go. Okay. But there's a point at which, you know, the questions that you've got that are legitimate questions. You're a good American as anyone else. Why would you be able to, why wouldn't you be able to at least be told something that lets you get on with your life, right? Or let yeah. you find, decide, okay, then I'll join up. You know, if you tell me what's going on and it's truthful and I can help, then I will. But if you're lying to me all this time, there's a point at which, you know, I just, if you let it go when they're lying to you, then you, then they're going to lie to your children. And if you're going to be cool with that, what about your children's children? You know, my thinking is, it's funny, I started to write an article the other day, and it was, the working title initially was, Zero Ethics, Zero Trust. Because I looked up something about the ethics of people who've been in the military, Department of Defense. What are the basic ethics? And honesty is one of the foundational ethics they expect i mean okay so thou shalt not lie is not in the ten commandments but it is in the ethical record that they expect their people to be honest but then what about all the people that we've talked about involved since 2017 with the whole nimitz thing up to today who i can show you they've not maybe they've how do you spin that right we've just provided an alternate truth <laughs> well. does that make you feel better <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, I'm not even kidding when I say that I've actually stopped and asked like 20 people, like, what is a U, what's UAP, or and then I even this is this sounds like I'm not trying to be insulting to the public, or whatever, because I'm, I'm a, I, 
I do recognize how dumb I am. So maybe I have one step up from some people. But I but I will say that um that I asked people what contrast meant. Oh, I mean, sorry, context meant. What context meant. And it almost seemed like no one could give me a direct answer for what I'm like. And these are like just modern day people and you followed. You just came here in 2017, of course, you know, like what the actual term context meant. And so, and, and I've recognized that it hasn't just happened. You followed, it happened all over culture. Like, you know, uh, criminal linguistic people will tell you that it's really hard to track the bad guy now because they don't use the trigger word. And so, but when you've gone the opposite way and like, you've just, you know, it, it, you've, it, you've taken the, you've, you use context as a weapon and you've basically told the world you've allowed the world to say this man was the ufo hunter he hunted aliens for the government that he's dealing with a uap problem and suddenly you start to just word associate yourself that you recognize that well i could stay with i could stay in the fine lines of being a good military patriot guy that's doing my job without ever really lying because hell i'm just speculating on this side but really I mean, like I said before, I mean, uh, there's companies right now that have been dealing with the UAP issue for 20 years. Never once was it associated with aliens. They literally were dealing with UAP, the, the uh, yeah. birds, balloons with raspberry pies shoved up their butts, literally. And like the Chinese were just trying to figure out every way. The War Zone has a great article on it, by the way. They did a great job. Uh, Tyler Rogueway, I don't know if you've read that article from uh, from them. It's called um, the the it's called the, the government. The government are oh, the Navy's being spied on, and they want you to think it's by aliens because it's for they just for years they've been trying to deal with this problem. They can't, the the ba the battlefield awareness is one of our most costly uh, and most effective weapons that we our systems that we have in play of being able to see things coming from space, from the boat, and everything. So when you find out that someone can get a balloon, you know, over your boat to gather text signatures and spoof your communications, something like that, that you're like, how the hell did this get there? And if it pops and falls in the ocean, well, it deteriorates and you don't go, who cares? It's a balloon, you know, a foil balloon that falls in salt water. I wonder what's going to happen to that over after a while. Um, you know, there, there just seems to be this, this, yeah. And it's just, it's just messed up because, you know, for people like myself who is, who, who think uh, they've actually seen things for real, the real deal, um, you know, up close, I feel like it, it gives this, it just gives this, this, the world hope when it's not hope we need, it's, it's effort and an actual, uh, actual, you know, attempt and integrity for the topic, but whatever I could, you know, I'm just commiserating over the miserable parts. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do at all with well, you here. Actually. You know, I'm sorry. For doing that. It, the real thing, what, what you saw, what, you know, Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea saw what plenty of other, the Portage County, Ohio, you know, any of these cases, what Socorro and Lonnie's, the real thing, whoever's, in charge, whoever's flying them around, whatever that intelligence's purpose is, is coming here for something. They have no. some reason for being here. If that's the case, then I can understand the military's job is to defend the nation, to look at it from that in that context. You know, like the FAA radar, which weeds out everything that's not flying like a jet, because the FAA's <laughs> job is to make sure that the planes are safe. All right, not a problem there. But if the things are actually coming here, then we need to at least in our own way decide if it's if it sounds like a drone, somebody's flying around, you know, the missile base. I think Ivy Lowe probably has all right, then fine. Let the missile let the missile base take care of it. More power to them. We definitely want the military looking at that. We need to delineate what it is that makes it the other five seven percent of cases that we yeah. can look at and say you know my little analogy that i throw out there is how many elephants does it take for elephants to exist it just takes one how many good solid no pun intended there ufo cases does it take to decide okay i'm not looking for drones if it's a little light in the night sky that goes there's <laughs> generally weird that people see. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. But I can't do anything with it. I need to focus on what we can. And I think there's something here that needs to be looked into, but we also need to be aware that there are con men out there. You know, there was an interesting article today that I saw about how many people fraudulently stole from the COVID-19 system, trying to support businesses, trying to keep them from, go under and how many people were just collecting millions and, cool. and you think, 
when you're trying to help people and you realize there are people out there that in their own minds justify, they think it's, they can get away with it. They think that it's fair game or they have no problem doing it. Well, how many people are sticking it to people like Paul Benowitz who, you know what, maybe we, you know, you know, I mean, I get it. You know, when you send people after, <laughs> after uh, Osama bin Laden, you definitely want Navy SEALs who will pull the trigger. Yeah. You want people who will do the job when it comes to it. I understand that we need good intelligence people. We need good politicians. But there is a point at which, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a Boy Scout. I get, you know, I get it. There are some people who just, Maybe Lou Elizondo is correct when he says at the Pentagon, there were people who just kept saying, oh, it's probably demonic and wanted to kill the program. Didn't want to put any money to it. Oh, the offset motto. <laughs> you know, I get it. I mean, I, like I said, I had somebody write me the other day was giving me this long spiel about how it's, you know, their preacher or someone tells them it's you know, Satan's yeah, army yeah. flying. And I'm like, I, you know, I want to write back and then I'm like, no, <laughs> I just, nothing I say is of any value is going to change what they want to believe. So, but there's things like what you described in the cases that, that are what this phenomenon is all about. Yeah. There may be time travelers. Okay. There may be conscious entities swarming I, you know, I don't know it could be yeah uh, that's the problem no, I can't you know but if it's not, if it doesn't if it's not something I can get my hands on or something I can analyze or my equipment or my tools can actually detect anything about then I can't you know then there's I yeah. have to sharpen my you know we need to sharpen our focus and weed out the the woo-woo I guess you can call it you know, it's it's, anyway. it's it's also deep. You know, to finish it, we I gotta let you go. Of course, I thank you so much for spending two hours with me. I did not expect right. to have it. I didn't uh, even but, notice. So, <laughs> <laughs> a couple things that real quick though. In the beginning, you were talking about your your encounter your parents had, and I know, and, and then how they didn't talk about it. Well, that's like lit, literally my biggest issue with with the most other than the tri flying triangle thing that came down. Um, the my friends and I, about eight of us, saw this guy. Um. You know, I, all I can say is quite literally, this is going to sound ridiculous, but this is this is how I still describe it today. A guy that had a like a horse-headed freak. That's how I describe this person. And uh, we had this encounter with him. And you know what? It got even crazier because he, he was banging on these windows. We saw him. We were like, what the hell is this person? And then a girl saw it screamed. We all ran out and left. The next day we checked where he, where he came through the wall. He, he had to have been able to go through walls. Okay, so that's the only way he could have been there. It's so ridiculous because the the story is much longer and stuff. But the point is, is that it's been now. That was in two thousand and four, and it has been. Um, it's been uh, almost every year. I try to get the people that were there with me to talk about this, and this is both. This is the, they're all response. Hey, Jeff, we saw a ghost or something. Which you just you know what, what are you gonna move like. If if I, I for me I saw something that made it so the the world that I live in isn't exactly how it's been explained to me the my science teacher telling me that there there are only nine planets kid you know there's not there's no more planets out that's literally what they told me you know planets are rare and special and we're, we're unlikely to ever see another planet in, our, in your lifetime and so um you know I, I I wonder by the way though if that if that not talking about it if not wanting to discuss it is kind of part of it for the for not that I think that there's something wrong with people or something but in general like the sense that only seemingly only a certain number of people even if they get the the if even if they get it wrong um i wake up to the fact that uh that this place does not operate quite as we're you know as our parents told us it was and uh you know and and i wonder if that means that um if there are rules in place that make it that way and we're every we're always going to be in that cycle because i got to tell you you can't, can't you can't get any more jarring than what we saw it can't get any more real to anyone. And they look at it today as adults and just be like, so it was a ghost. Well, what the hell is a ghost then? Like, you know, like explain yeah, yourself. Yeah. You know. And there's, to me, there's, it's interesting you bring that up because it kind of goes to something that I don't know whether I think of it as a problem I have or whether it's just like you were saying, there are some people that think things or experience things and see way beyond the, you know, the implications 
of yeah. what it means beyond that. And it's that idea of asking that other question, why? Or if in your case, you saw something you don't understand and you wonder why, and then you, the other people saw it too and seem to want to just dismiss it casually. And that also makes you wonder why. It says something about the human condition that certain people seem to, you know, it's funny because I, whenever I think along this line, I remember the scene in Dumb and Dumber where he's in the bathroom stall about to get his ass kicked. And he just starts going, go to my happy place, go to my happy place. Because he's trying to just shut his mind off. And yeah. at times I, I think there are people who will go there and it's pleasant. But there are also people who will fight. And I've seen this happen even in friends of mine who will just almost go nuclear, so to speak, to argue why are you, it'd be like if you brought up that thing to one of your friends and some of them say it was a ghost, they seem to just write it off. And, but somebody else looks at you and stands up and wants to scream and yell, why do you keep, and you realize, whoa, there's mm -hmm. something different in them that is being challenged if they don't want to go there. But yeah. instead of just dismissing, closing their eyes and hurry on, they turn and immediately, it's almost, maybe it's what some of the people Elizondo referred to who just decide it's demonic. Because if I just say it's demonic, then I don't have to think about it. And I don't want to anyway, because I'm on the side of God. So I'm not going to pay any attention to anything that's of the devil. And it's a convenient way to me to just write off everything. I don't want to think about it. Psychologically, that's funny. I, when it comes to this whole phenomenon, I think in some cases, the biggest problem is people is our own psychological approach or fears or whatever it is that makes us uncomfortable about it that in some cases they just say it was a ghost and you think okay is it that they really don't see it i mean they don't get what you're why it's so fascinating to, with you that what does it say about the bigger the larger world or larger reality whatever it is out there that mm -hmm. other people are just like you know, I mean, Winston Churchill had the famous saying, and I've probably said this before, you know, that some people, and I'm paraphrasing badly here, people sometimes stumble over the truth, but most people just pick themselves up and dust themselves off and hurry on their way. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. It's something to that effect. But you realize that's a lot of the world we live in, that people for some reason just seem to step up and, and move along. And why you're, you know, like my parents experience when I'm like to this day, I'm thinking, how could you not have seen that as a life changing event that tells you there's far more? I mean, if it was a religious experience like Fatima or some of these experiences yeah. people have that they call miracles, but they put it in a religious context, that seems safe. And yeah. For some reason, they can now hold on more tightly to that. And, and that's OK. There are some beliefs I think people can be allowed to have and you shouldn't mess with it. <laughs> it's what's like my father was a psychiatrist, like he used to say, sometimes that's all that's holding them together. They need <laughs> to hold on to that belief. So yeah. you, can leave it, you can leave it alone for now anyway. <laughs> so you talk about history repeating itself. We have basically similar things that when Blue Book was run for so many years and then dismissed, but people know that there were other behind the scenes avenues yeah. for things. Even in 1973, when you had Hynek and even uh, Commander Coyne from the Coyne Helicopter Encounter talking to Congress. And if you live long enough, you'll see these different times when it looks like there's some disclosure. Right. But to me, it appears more that for whatever reason, either the public doesn't have enough meat, meaning factual stuff, to yeah. force the issue forward. Or the powers that be realize the best thing to do is to let, let them blow off steam once in a while, get it all going to where everybody thinks it's got something going and then it wears itself out. And then it all goes back like a volcano that just erupts a, a little point. bit and goes back. Well, and that's, I think what's my feeling right now is this is what we've had in the last four years is something was either out there of significance, whether it was, Leading to the Nimitz case, and I happen to think perhaps it was. Somebody was mm -hmm. concerned too much might get out, that it's best to manage the situation. 
by bringing together people claiming they're going to get disclosure going, then they can mitigate it. Yeah, absolutely. Have, so we change it to UAP. We don't want it to be called something we can't manipulate with Congress. And then now you've got it in a budget, but it sounds like we're not going to be told the real meat of these classified yeah. briefings anyway. So the public is, if you look at the Facebook groups and you'll realize the temperature is like, <laughs> Yellowstone oh, yeah. is not ready to blow yet. <laughs> I mean, clearly the second they all found out that all this stuff is exempt from disclosure, they, I think deep down that all the ad hoc reasoning just kind of started coming out. And then, like you said, it just was, people really got that gut shot, especially when their hero flat out said to everyone on podcast, disclosure already happened. There's a UAP office. What more do you want? What no, more do you want? I'm on something. The same, the same people at the beginning who were running interference back when Reed got it supposedly started are now in charge and have been right. running it. We're in charge of the UAPT task force. And then now we're going to be running the task force for the OUSDI. It's like the Fox is really now in charge of the hen house. Yes. And the farmer's in on it you're like what that was a good that was good i was gonna say teddy atlas who my one of my favorite coaches in the world would say if you caught the guys robbing the bank on thursday you don't hire them on saturday to guard the bank yeah. like simple yeah, as that yeah. all right exactly uh, where the weak points are right yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay thank you so much right. i appreciate all the time it. Appreciate uh, it. It, sir do you want to just plug if you want anyone to go anywhere do you if do you have something that you plug or i i know that you you were talking about a martin show possibly actually printing your book is that a possibility um, or i'm hoping to i you know that's a i'm thinking about it there are some things i would like to have happen that i don't know if they would happen um that would make it worth doing to me i mean i have a website actually i have two of them one xdes publishing which really kind of talks about the book and has some of the images that paul took in there and, and actually ray stanford's film which there's a long story on that but in all honesty that's a film that I think would really break some eggs, so to speak, if that came yeah. out, because there is a huge story behind that. But I also have one on Exodus Digital, which is what some documentaries that I want to do. One I'm working on right now on the Socorro case, which I just found out something the other day that has just set me on my heels because Man. I don't even know how to wrap my mind around it relating to that case. But I've really? been doing some animation work on, on it. But anyway, but that one's not even turned on yet. If you it's go, one of my favorite you'll cases. Page, you'll, you'll get a page on that one. But I have actually three video, three documentaries I'd like to do, but I've got to you know, talk about funding, right? Yeah, I've got to try to do a little bit of looking for some funding of my own. So I'm working on a teaser for the Socorro thing right now, and now I'm having to rethink part of it because of what I learned the other day. But when I get that out there, I'll let you know. <laughs> can you can you give us a hint? Good or bad news you've heard? Um, a, 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 a revelatory moment or more of a... Well, let's just say one of the big... This, my take, my interest in the Socorro case is not just to do another... I mean, I want to do an animation that's as accurate as if he was the, you were standing right there and you saw it. Yeah, that, I mean, awesome. what we could do today. Nothing like... I've seen on these TV shows. So that's been a big thing. I mean, at heart, I'm, I'm an artist. Some of my, where I got into Lonnie and Socorro was because I was wanting to do a book way back in the early 80s on, on painting before computers. Thing. But the whole idea of this red mark that was seen on it, and there's books written. And I mm -hmm. actually had Lonnie, he drew, I have a documentation when I was working on the painting where he drew for me what the some real one yeah and then just the other day from what i consider enough of a credible source like i said to just make me stop what it may actually have been because where it came from is enough to even make me question what lonnie drew for me how's that i mean that lonnie really? himself, but I mean, Lonnie, I have no problem with Lonnie. I mean, his integrity in my opinion is beyond reproach. Seems so. But if he was hanging on to what he was not supposed to talk about, and I, well, then I'm not. It's like Ernest Edwards. If, yeah, if I ask him about Paul Benowitz, Edwards is siding with the Air Force, and I get it. <laughs> but the point was, so I'm now I'm having to go back and rethink some of how I'm going to either present that or use it in the teaser. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I boy. I cannot give away the store because I do. Yeah, at some point, I just need to get some funding to go do some shoot it, shooting and whatnot. But I have a couple of other videos. One of them actually is Paul Benowitz. 
the story cool. evolving of it, so I'd love to do some real animation and give the whole background of what he saw up to date, so to speak. That would be really cool. more to do. More to do. Yeah, well, if um, you know, by the time if you when you if you get those uh, out there, I'd be happy to play them on the NX network. I mean, I don't have a lot of video watcher of uh, viewers. I have, they're all listeners, but the NX network has a ton of people, ton of people to uh, watch over there, and I'd be happy to get them out. But um, I'm just gonna take a shot in the dark here. It was a cross. No. Never mind. No, was, <laughs> no don't funny. tell me. Don't tell me. No, no, it was funny because some of it goes to how you interpret the Spanish description. But at the same time, when I first heard it, I remember thinking, wait a minute. That raises another question because I could see, <laughs> and this is the point. The point is, you know, the most common one people have talked about these days is the inverted V with three lines through it. Yeah. Or the the horseshoe I... shape with an arrow in the middle, and but what I was told, and I'm still track, trying to track it down. But what I was, I'm waiting for the drawing. Let's put it that way, was something so unique. But I saw something similar to it elsewhere, oh, not yeah. exact, but it's just been. Believe me, it's like when you yeah. reach the end and you think I'm ready to step forward, and suddenly. There's a wrench thrown in. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. All right. Well, we'll it's the eye of Horus. Okay. Moving on. Let's. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll, I won't say anything else. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I look forward to speaking again. It's, it, it's, whenever you'll come back on, I'd love to have you on to talk Anytime. more, of course. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate and, uh, it. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day, sir. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, night, that is, rather. We've talking into, spoken yeah, into the night. <laughs> See you later. Have a good night. Thanks for watching and listening to this episode of Strange Recon Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, you can head over to www.patreon.com forward slash strange recon and give as little as $5 a month. And, of course, you can support the show entirely free right now. Pretend you're paying your Netflix bill, your Peacock bill, Hulu bill, whatever. You don't have to pay anything. Just go down, hit that like, and subscribe. Add us to your playlist. Share us on Twitter with the hashtag UFO, tw UFO Twitter. Come on. Play your role. Have you made it this far yet in the show? It's two, two hours and 20 minutes. Have you made it here yet? This is the secret ending of the show. Put this passcode in www. I'm just kidding. There's no passcode. Goodbye. <laughs>